Hey everybody, today Rado Talks through episode 22 of the podcast, and before I get going, huge apologies for how late I am. I know, I know, I'm very, very sorry. Basically, what happened is Jen's been on the road for over five weeks, and seeing as how she missed out on last month's, which was also late because I was trying to give her a chance to actually get on, I didn't want to go a second month without getting her on because that'd be a second month where we basically skipped the Q&A section entirely, and that list is getting pretty long. So, had to wait. Jen finally got back a couple days ago. Even though she's feeling a little under the weather, she got on the mic yesterday, and so now I'm just putting the finishing touches on this. So, that we can continue. Although, uh, seeing as I'm so late, I'm going to try to get back on schedule, so the next podcast is going to be coming your way in maybe three weeks or so. And because of that, I think next podcast might be a little on the short side because there won't be very many questions to have come into questions at Rado.com. I don't know if there'll be that many new games I've discovered. So I think what I'm going to do today is, seeing as how the Q&A is going to be so long, we're just going to do new games of interest that I've found in the last four or five weeks and go straight to the Q&A. We'll skip the top 10 recap And that means on the next one, there'll be two top 10 recaps. And so hopefully we'll get an even keel in terms of overall podcast length, which is ridiculously long. But all that aside, let's get going right after this. Okie doke, everybody. So let's talk about some new interesting games I have discovered recently. We're going to kick it off with Imperial Spells and Steam. Although the Imperial is spelled really weird. It's E-M-P-Y-R-E-A-L instead of the normal Imperial. Imperial, it looks like. So it's Imperial Spells and Steam. And here's the interesting thing about this game. It is a train Route building game, like you know, Martin Wallace, Age of Steam type things. Although it's called Spells and Steam instead of Age of Steam or something like that. But the odd bit is it's actually set in a fantasy universe where players are trying to build a rail line, but they're casting spells and whatnot to do it. That's very, very cool. I don't know if that means it is kind of an Old West situation, but it's a weird West where there's spells, or maybe this is set in a typical fantasy environment, or some kind of steampunk world. I don't really know. But I got to admit, while a lot of train games come out, and not that many of them catch our attention, this one really does stand out, because I really kind of am intrigued by that mix and match. It's from the designer of Arjun the Consortium, which was a game I passed on running through because it had too much take that in it, but I've heard nothing but how awesome it is. And so that designer is returning for a new game, and it'll be interesting to find out more about Imperial Spells and Steam. And then next up, we've got Caverna uh, Hul gegen Hul, which I assume means um, Home Sweet Home, maybe? And a lot of people say, Oh my gosh, finally an expansion for Caverna! Sorry, folks. I think I read not too long ago, there are never going to be any expansions for Caverna. That, you know, you've had a few promos that have come out here and there, but Uwe has kind of moved on. And he will not be revisiting that in the same way that Agricola has gotten so many expansions over the year. So that's kind of heartbreaking for all the Caverna fans out there. What is this Caverna? It is basically a two-player only spinoff. And the interesting thing about it is, from what I've read, this one looks like it's something that Jen and I will enjoy more than the full version because it actually supports setup variability, where every time you play, you set up your own little Caverna board with a whole bunch of tiles face down, and as you're building and expanding, you're flipping those tiles up to see what's available to you. That's much cooler than what ultimately Caverna ended up being, at least for Jens and mine. I mean, I know a lot of people like Caverna more than Agricola and whatnot. I've talked about that at great length in the past. All I know is, I love the theme of a Caverna. I liked a fancy version of Agricola, and while it's a big brother didn't work out, I'm very, very excited about this one, you know, because hopefully Uwe is you know, kind of changed his ways after what was the uh, the La Havre inland port two player only game had no setup variability, and neither did the Agricola all creatures big and small. Although they ultimately ended up re- releasing some expansions for that, so it has setup variability. But Caverna's two player uh, Huda Gegen Huda it has v- variability built in. Hooray! Very very interested to try this one. Next up. This is a really odd entry. It's actually two. It's Codenames Disney Family Edition and Codenames Marvel Edition. Which means 
It's basically code names, but apparently all the cards that you're trying to build clues off of are going to be related to, I guess, Disney animated feature films and or Marvel superheroes. So that's actually really, really neat. I like that quite a bit. I don't know if I'll be able to play the Marvel one with Jen very much because she, I mean, she can barely remember the movie. She certainly doesn't anything about the comic books. But the, you know, we both are kind of aficionados of Disney animated feature films. So, I mean, I really am excited about that. And to me, hopefully, what's most interesting about them is you'll just be able to mix them in with regular code names and code name pictures so that you can just get wild, crazy variety. I mean, you know, seeing, you know, some pictures, seeing some generic words, and then seeing characters from Beauty and the Beast or The Hunchback of Notre Dame, all that together sounds really, really awesome to me. So it made my list. Codenames Disney Family Edition, and to a lesser extent, because of Jen's lack of interest, Codenames Marvel Edition. Then after that, we've got Motainai Wutai Mountain, which is the first expansion for Motainai. And if you saw my run-through for it, you remember I said that while I don't think it usurps Glory to Rome, seeing as how they're both from the same designer, Carl Chuddock, and a lot of people had hoped Motainai would be their way to get some Glory to Rome action, seeing as how it's been out of print forever and it's all but impossible to find. Well, Matainai, as it was, it came in the box, wasn't quite a Glory to Rome killer, although it was a keeper. I mean, Jen and I very much enjoyed it. Who knows? Maybe an expansion adding a whole bunch. What it promises is a bunch of new powerful combos, apparently. That's a very, very cool thing. One of the things Glory to Rome has over Matainai is Matainai just doesn't have very many cards in it. So I'm really curious to see the thing get you know blown out and expanded. And who knows, maybe in time it will eclipse Glory to Rome. So anyway, you can look for that coming soon. Then, oh, this one's very, very cool. Oh, well, kind of. Well, it's cool to me. It'll be interesting to see how Jen responds to it. It's called U-Boat the Board Game. And this one is basically set... It's, it's a submarine simulation. And I'm assuming it means we're doing all the kind of, you know, running silent, running deep, trying to stay ahead of the hunters and become the hunted ourselves and, you know, sink battleships and all that sort of stuff. But what's interesting about this is it is a real-time, cooperative, asymmetrical game that has a smartphone app that keeps the whole game running. Not just a timer, but that, you know, like some other games in the past, most notably XCOM, although there have been a few others that do this, it, uh, you know, the, the app is absolutely essential to keep throwing new, um, uh, you know, objectives and and obstacles to overcome and to smartly kind of design an interesting gameplay experience for you. Like I said, this is kind of similar to XCOM because that's what XCOM was a cooperative game that was real time and everybody has asymmetrical powers and there was an app that ran the whole thing. Now, the designer has actually posted on my 2017 geek list of interest when I posted here that While, you know, on the surface there might be overlap between XCOM and this, the gameplay between the two is radically different. And I can totally see how that is, because one was basically a defense game, and the other one is you actually hunting down ships and trying to stay alive. So, long story short, I am super excited about this. The only hesitation I have is how Jen will respond to the fact that we are playing the role of a submarine, presumably trying to sink a lot of ships and kill a lot of sailors, because um, you know, that's what they do. And unfortunately, you know, warfare-type simulations are kind of a turnoff for Jen. But there sounds like there's so much cool in this game, I can't help but want to give it a try anyway. That is U-Boat, the board game. Next up, there is The Expanse. And there's two reasons I'm interested in this one. One, it's um, from Jeff Engelstein who is a really, really smart guy. He does the very, very cool Ludology podcast and also makes occasional guest appearances on the Dice Tower podcast talking about game design. And he's designed a few games now. And all of the games he's done are very cool, very smart, clever, outside-the-box style experiences. And unfortunately, I've not been able to really play any of them so far because they just don't tick our boxes. I mean, the one that was... I forget the name of it, but that was basically kind of like StarCraft, the board game. It had a lot of player versus player. And then Space Cadets and Space Cadets Dice Duel, they were a bunch of player versus player as well, even though I desperately wanted to play those and enjoy those. But they just had no kind of cooperative element. And, um, oh, and he just put out the one about um, bar brawls in some kind of fantasy universe. That seems cool. But again, it's a player versus player, which is lots of take that, lots of in-your-face player conflict. 
And so anyway, I've been wanting to play a Jeffrey Engelstein game for so long because it just seems so clever and smart. And then when I heard about the expansion, said, hey, it's a new Jeff Engelstein game. Yay! Maybe this will be the one. Particularly because the other thing that got me very excited is the theme. This is based on a hugely popular series of science fiction novels and now a hugely successful TV show called The Expanse, which is about man... It's not a really... It's, got, it's hard science fiction. It's about mankind's near future. We've just kind of taken steps out into the... The solar system, we're starting to terraform Mars. We have mining operations going on, you know, in the, in the asteroid belt. And it, uh, you know, and it, it doesn't do any kind of far out stuff. It's really just kind of very grounded in, you know, speculative near future fiction. And it's a really, really, I've been, in, I haven't read the books, but I've really been enjoying the TV show. You know, fascinating political machinations, you know, conspiracy stuff. And like I said, really cool, hard sci fi, you know, dealing with the, the true effects of, you know, living in zero G and all that kind of stuff. So The Expanse, first of all, is just a uh, phenomenal TV show. And I guess it's a really wonderful series of books. And so a game based on that from Jeff Engelstein, I was super duper stoked. Now, since I, I now I entered this on February twenty third, and I would have talked about this. Um, actually, no, I, I just missed talking about this in the last podcast. I don't remember now. Uh, time has lost all meaning to me. But I was excited enough when I first heard that. Just expanse and Jeffrey Engelstein. So I put it on the list. Since then, Jeff has talked about it a little bit, and my excitement has cooled a bit. Although for reasons that would probably make a lot of people very excited. Apparently, the gameplay of this is kind of Twilight Struggle-ish. It's a, you know, it's a card-driven area control player conflict game. Ah, no! Where you know, one player... But the interesting thing, unlike Twilight Struggle, which is a two-player only game, this can be up to four players. With one player playing the Earth faction, one Mars, one the Belters, and one the... Well, here, okay, I should say one thing about this. If you are interested in watching the show and have not watched it yet, or have not read the books yet, don't go reading very much about this game. Because just the very description of this game from Jeff starts talking about big, big, huge plot spoilers. So hopefully uh, people haven't just already gone to Google and done a search for it, because if you do, you will have major elements of the plot spoiled. So... I would strongly recommend, if you're at all interested in The Expanse, watch the series, catch up with it. It's in the middle of its second season right now before you read anything about this game because, like I said, it's going to have huge spoilers just right there on the back of the box, right there in the description. So I'm not going to describe it anymore other than I'm kind of bummed. The gameplay is Twilight Struggle-ish. But, I mean, that's cool for some people because a four-player Twilight Struggle in a hard sci-fi universe based on a really popular franchise, that's really cool in a lot of ways. Uh, time will tell if it's for me and Jen or if it'll be yet another time that Jeff Engelstein has broken my heart. But anyway, let's move on. Uh, there's a couple of expansions to talk about for Time Stories that recently got announced. Uh, Estrella Drive, and I have no idea how to pronounce this. It's French. Uh, Fres de la Cote, F-R-E-R-E-S-D-E-L-A-C-O-T-E. I have no idea how to pronounce it. I guess I should have done a search for it ahead of time. Hopefully that when this does get published, they will actually tell us what the name is in English. Let's just do a translate on that and see if I can find out. Translate.google.com. Show me what that says. Alf English, please. Or, you know, not Francais. Translate. Detect language. Switch it to English. Oh, and of course, it failed because, hey, everybody, I live in Malta, and I've been having really choppy internet all day, and, yep, it's just not going to work. Great. Let's try Let's try a babblefish. Uh, see if you give me something here. Are you going to work? Brothers of the Coast. Okay. Brothers of the Coast, and what was the other one? Uh, Estrella Drive. So, these have been announced. I'll be shocked if either of them makes it out in 2017 because it seems like all of these have run really, you know, anywhere from three to six months late. But hey, if they come out, great. Uh, Estrella Drive is basically set in the early 80s in Hollywood. That's all they said. I'm going to assume it's some kind of Chinatown esque film noir, detective, hard boiled, uh, tracking down a crime thing. Yeah, that's total guess on my part. I have no idea if that's the case. If it is, that's fine. Although I have to admit, I'd really be much more interested in uh, adventure that is a little bit, um, you know, more about the subject matter. You know, trying to put on a movie in Hollywood, and but I'm sure there'll be mystery elements. There probably just will be. And what was it? Brothers of the Coast is set 
in uh, the Caribbean in the time of high seas piracy. So if you've been wanting to do a time stories where you get to play a Captain Jack Sparrow-esque character, well, your wishes are going to be met. And I mean... I'm excited for both of these. I have to admit the most recent one, Expedition Endurance, was kind of a letdown for me and Jen. Uh, we were both kind of disappointed by it. So I hope, you know, the, the next one, which is said in medieval Spain, and then the two after this, kind of get us back to where we were earlier. I mean, originally, these things all were kind of like escape rooms with this cool temporal element, and they seem to be kind of getting away from that. I hope we see a return to form with these, but... Who knows? Time will tell. But anyway, uh, Time Stories, Brothers of the Coast, and Estrella Drive are going to be coming at some time in the near future. And then what else do I have written down here? Oh, Aeon's End War Eternal. Now, Aeon's End made my top ten games of last year. Absolutely phenomenal cooperative fantasy adventure deck building game. Really, really great stuff. Uh, um, in time with the first one that came out, two little mini expansions came out. But War Eternal is going to be the first really big expansion. In fact, it's so big, it's a standalone game. You can just buy this either to play by itself or as an expansion to the base. I'm sold. Jen, I really, really enjoyed Aeon's End. So I cannot wait to see some more cool Aeon's End stuff. It's looking like the publisher, Indie uh, Board and Cards is going to be making this their evergreen, you know, their their dominion. They'll just keep on coming out with more and more stuff. I'm not going to complain about that. Okay, next up we've got Otis, which is O-T-Y-S. O-T-Y-S. I don't know if that's Otis or Oats or something like that. I'm just going to call it Otis. And uh, this is on the list because it's from Sebastian Dujardin who uh, was the designer on Deus and one of the co-designers on Twa. I mean, and some other stuff as well. He is a smart, smart cookie. He's a really great designer. And while I have to admit Deus was ultimately a pass for me and Jen because it had a little bit too much player versus player conflict woven into it, still, I thought the design was absolutely brilliant. One of the best games of that year. One of the best games in recent years. Just not for me and Jen. I am hoping Otis which has a really interesting setting. It's a post-apocalypse setting. It kind of sounds like a Waterworld-type setting because apparently we spend all our time in um, diving suits, diving to the bottom of the ocean, where we find the ruins of modern-day cities, and we're trying to find artifacts and treasures and bring them back up because they're absolutely essential in this post-apocalyptic future. I don't know. That's, I mean, it, so it sounds like kind of Waterworld, the board game. Probably minus anything with gills. Probably more of like a grounded Waterworld, the board game. So, I mean, more like Mad Max, but with ocean-y type stuff. I don't know. It seems like, from what I've described, the, the stuff on the surface is completely immaterial. And, in fact, it didn't need to have this post-apocalypse setting at all. It could just be set in modern day, trying to dive down and find treasures from antiquities. But... All that is beside the point to me. All I know is Sebastian is a phenomenal designer. Pearl Games keeps on putting out great game after great game. So Otis is high on my must-play list for this year. And after that, we've got Custom Heroes, which is, I have to admit, is a really odd title. I I have to wonder if that's a placeholder. Although, oh, look at this. Um, Since adding it, when they added it, there was almost no information at all. But they have now put a box cover art. Let me take a look at that and see if the box cover art... Is it really going to be called Custom Heroes? Yeah, apparently that is the name of the game. Custom Heroes. Okay, fine. Here's why it made my list. It's a sequel. Not a sequel. It is a spin-off. It's a follow-up. It basically uses the same card crafting system of Mystic Veil, where it's a deck builder, but instead of building the deck, the deck already exists with all the cards that will ever be added to it. You instead build and modify the cards inside your deck throughout the game and make them more and more powerful. Mystic Veil was probably my pick for most innovative game of last year. Jen, I really, really liked it, and when the expansion came out, that really solidified the game and made it a standalone game that is is worthy. We really, really like it. So I can't wait to see the same basic mechanism applied to presumably a very, very different playing style game. It's probably not going to be the same kind of push your luck resource gathering thing. What I'm worried is it, whether it's going to be some kind of you know Magic the Gathering inspired, I make my custom hero, you make your custom hero, and we duel against each other. I'll be kind of bummed if that's the case. I really hope it's, oh, I'm building my custom hero, which is represented by this deck, you're doing yours, and it's a cooperative game, and we both fight against other stuff. Or it's like Thunderstone, and we're just racing to, you know, to use our custom decks to beat the most stuff. I really hope it's not a player versus player, you know, uh, smash them up, you know, beat each other up kind of thing. 
Fingers crossed, because if it is, it'll probably come off my list. But right now, Custom Heroes is high on my list. And now, the last game of interest for this month, just read about this morning. Really, really interesting. It's called Raid on uh, Taihoku. T-A-I-H-O-K-U. Why am I spelling these? You can just see them all in the show notes. Raid on Taihoku. Uh, apparently, which is uh, what t- uh, Taipei used to be called. Or maybe Taihoku is someplace in Taipei. I'm not 100% certain. I didn't research it that much. Like I said, I only just read about this thing a half an hour ago. But, I, you know, I, I like always, I, I'm always checking for any new game that gets added to Board Game Geek. Uh, you know, 99 out of 100, I pretty much end up ignoring. And, um, you know, often because they say World War II, um, you know, conflict battle games. And when I went to Raid Attack, uh, that was the first thing I saw. Oh, it's a World War II game. I'll probably pass. But I started reading the description, and I'm so glad I did. Because while this is a World War II simulation recreation game... It is not a war game. It actually casts players in the role of civilians. The civilians of Taioku when it is being bombed by um, U.S. bombers. Uh, that. And, and it's a cooperative game where players are trying to survive. Um, that's amazing to me. I am super duper stoked about this um, game and that subject matter. Once again, like you boat up above, I worry that Jen will want to pass on it because of the subject matter. I mean, that's kind of grim. Although Jen really enjoyed Grizzled, she was able to make a go of that. So, um, you know, based on that, I'm, I, I, you know, as soon as I heard about what this game is, a co-opter game where everybody has unique special abilities and we're civilians trying to survive a U.S. bombing of, uh, you know, I mean, the, the city was bombed, I guess, because the, Japan had. Um, uh, you know, seized it, and you know they, they had set up operations there, so they were really trying to dr- bomb the Japanese. But civilians uh, got hit hard, and that's who we are in this game, and we're trying to survive. That's astounding to me. That is such a cool, exciting, engaging theme. I hope the gameplay lives up to it because, man, I am there for that theme. Huge, big, big time. So anyway, that is my last new game of interest for this month: Raid on Taioku. And that's it, folks. Now, um, what you've all been waiting for, it's time for Q&A in just a little bit. Okay, everybody, Q&A time, and this is going to be a monster of a question and answer segment because we didn't do one last month because Jen was on the road. But she is finally back now. She seems to be covered with beagles even (laughs) as we speak. My favorite condition. Yep. And uh, first, as always, we're going to do the game-related ones. Then we'll do the personal ones. I don't know if Jen will have much to say, but if she wants to, she can chime in in between scratching Daisy behind the ears and catching up on a month's worth of email. Uh, But after all that's done, we'll get into the personal stuff. That's how we'll end it. And anybody who doesn't care about that can just skip. And as always... Any questions, send them to questions at raw.com, and we will cover those in a future podcast. But without further ado, let's start out with Brian, who has a few questions. One, what would be my top 10 verbs I would like to see in games? Verbs? Remember I talked about this in some podcasts, or maybe you weren't here for it. It's, (laughs) It's kind of a video game designer thing. We always talk about the verbs. What is the verb of this game, whether it's kill or explore or collect or whatever? And so I've mentioned that in the past, and apparently it's stuck with Brian. So he wants to know my top ten verbs. I know one of them was visceral. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not a verb. That would be a, uh, is that an adjective? Yes. So, no, I guess it could be, or, yeah, anyway, though. No, um, my top five verbs would probably be build, explore, collect. Um, interact. Interact. Yeah, but as really specific meaning under board gamers, most people think board, uh, interacting means attacking each other. No, I mean uh, interact would be like you have to do this to get that. Mm-hmm. You have to interact with this thing too. Yeah, what would you call that as a verb? I mean, because you're, you're talking about combos. Yeah, I that, guess so. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, arguably that's engine building, but you also want to run the engine. So, I don't know, chaining? Maybe that's a verb? To chain things together? Ch- I'll, I'll say chaining is a verb. Okay. That's four. And I'm going to say Enjoy. Because, of course... <laughs> but that be... enjoyment is not a gameplay verb. It's a, it's a no, verb... No, I enjoy that. That is a verb. Oh. It, it, yes, it is a verb, but it's not a verb in the purposes of this particular question is, if you were to, if you were to reduce a game 
down to one single verb that describes the、mm-hmm. action of that game. For a lot of games,、uh, war games, it's kill. Yeah. Or destroy. Comboing. Right, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, yeah, that's, that's a reasonable one.、Um, you know, chaining or comboing. That's, a, that's an interesting. Explore, obviously. Yeah, I, I mentioned that Did one. Did you get that one? No. And I'm, I'm at four. I've got, I've got build, which is probably my number one, and explore, I love explore. collect, chain, and one more. Shop. You know, like finding things in the shops? That... Improve, upgrade. Improve, there you go. Upgrade. Yeah, the, there you go. I couldn't tell you the order. But I know build would be a number one. Although build and upgrade are kind of the same thing, but it's a different thing building myself versus building a thing. You know, I mean, upgrading, leveling up, et cetera, et cetera. What co op setting would、uh, we really like to explore? Um. Mm hmm. Uh huh. I, I don't know. There's. Ah! Jen's got nothing. That's okay. What would I really like to explore? I mean, I, I really like fantasy. I like science fiction. I like all the tropey trope game tropes.、Um, I like adventure things. I yeah, like, fantasy stuff. I like stuff. the like, climbing K2, and I like this spelunking game. Cave? Or, yeah, the cave and K2, both、yeah. from the same designer. Both from the same guy. I'm just thinking about. So you're saying you would want more extreme sports games? Well, I, I don't know. See, because actually, to me, I enjoy K2 and Cave almost in spite because, because, I don't know, we've tried to watch movies and documentaries about death defying risks as people tried to climb Everest or K2, and I always think, I just can't get involved because it just all strikes me as so silly and pointless. And all the effort and blood, sweat, and tears these people put into the act of climbing a mountain、mm. could go towards so many things. It would be so much more valuable and meaningful. I understand that climbing a mountain is very, very meaningful for them, but I just don't get it. But I do enjoy K2. But it's kind of in spite of the theme, not because of it. But you're saying you actually like those themes? Well, I'm thinking. I'm kind、um, of surprised. What's the game that goes. That's Tobago. Thanks. That's an adventure game. Yes, but I mean, but you were. Yeah, I mean, that's a more traditional <laughs> adventure game. You were talking about adventure meaning climbing a mountain. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just. I like adventure. Okay. Adventure in all its many forms. Yep. Right. Uh. Well, I know one thing you would probably love because you always you've mentioned this several times on the podcast. A game set in an alternate world where yeah, with time travel or different dimensions or something like that. Well, yeah, I wasn't going to say that. I mean, you always go on because you read that book about Khan,、mm-hmm. Genghis Khan, and how the world would be radically different today if they hadn't had that council because one of the Khans died or something like yep. that, yep, and yep. just changed literally the entire course of the world. And you always. Mentioned, well, what would it be like if it hadn't changed? What would that world be like? You know, so stuff like that would be really, really cool. Yeah. I, I mean,、do. I was listening in a podcast the other day talking where they were hypothesizing what today's world would be like if Archduke Ferdinand hadn't been assassinated, which led to、mm-hmm. World War I. Yeah. Because it was a podcast talking about the, well, should you go back in time and kill baby Hitler? And somebody said, no, you shouldn't do that. You should go back and do, make a real difference. Get rid of that one assassination that, you know, created this whole. Domino effect that led to World War I, which was a big part of what made Hitler who he was. Yep, and, so t- yep. take care of that instead. And, you know, I mean, that would be fascinating. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, alternate Earth type stuff would be really, really cool. But I don't know. I mean, I, I wouldn't mind a cooperative game about the daily life of, of Eskimos or, or, or the settling of Australia as a penal colony. That would be fantastic. That would be a phenomenal setting. Yeah.、Um, Yeah, so all kinds of stuff. Just about anything you can imagine.、Uh, if you could get a license for some IP, like Game of Thrones or The Walking Dead, that doesn't have a great game yet, what IP would you nab and what kind of game would you make? Do you have anything, honey? Nothing. You can't think of a single TV show you like that you'd like to see a game of? I don't know.、That's, okay. It's really hard for me. My brain's not. I've been、doesn't、away for five weeks. Those out of the air? No. I mean. I haven't watched any TV for five weeks. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you asked at the wrong time, Brian. For me, it's my go to answer is always Thundar the Barbarian, which I'd absolutely love to see as a, a cooperative adventure game set in that universe. It'd be so amazing. Okay, G- moving on to Jason, who、uh, heard about the response in the last podcast about legacy gaming. And he, distinction between legacy gaming and campaign, distinction of lots of that. Le- le- right, so he's. Where's the question? All righty. I'm looking for a question mark in Jason's <laughs> 5,500 word. All right. I don't know how much comes from the stickers. 
Okay, all right. This is a further definition of what defines legacy. And he's talking specifically about Charterstone, which doesn't... uh, Charterstone is touting itself as a legacy game with no destruction. But, uh, you know, it does put stickers on the board and and whatnot. Was that a legacy game? Putting stickers on the board is destruction, as far as I'm concerned. You are taking a board that was in one state and permanently altering it. The board as it came no longer exists. It's a new board. The old board was destroyed and creating this new board. I think people get way too hung up on the ripping up cards. I think people really get hung up on it who haven't actually played the game. Because if you've played Pandemic Legacy, the cards you rip up, they have no use anyway. I mean, you, 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 you do the thing that's associated with them, and after all that's done, as a final job done, moving on, putting in the rearview mirror, you rip up the card because it has no further function in the game. I, you know, it's, 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 it's so beside the point. It's, it's kind of a nice little cathartic, right, we took care of that, let's get rid of it and move on to the next thing. I mean, I love that, but a game like Charterstone that's permanently putting stickers... I mean... The whole point of Charterstone is after you've played it, however many times you're going to play it, it's a, it's a Euro style building up a city and um, you know being able to run that city to earn victory points style game, as I understand it. But every time you play, you add it's it's like Agricola or something like that, where the board doesn't reset every single time you play. The state of the world from the last time continues, and the city continues to build on top of the old city, and it changes and evolves over the ages. That you're, every time you start playing another game and you start putting stickers on top of other stickers or however it might work, you're destroying them. So yeah, it's a legacy game. There's only one thing a game needs to be called legacy. There has to be a permanent legacy to the decisions you make. It, they can't be undone. And it's a legacy game. Okie doke. Let's see here. Nate wonders... Sometimes he has trouble gauging if he likes mechanisms... And wonders if I have any suggestions about how to better handle short of buying, finding out a game. Or, you know, trying a game somebody has. You know, what's a good way to gauge whether you're going to like a mechanism? I would suggest watching Rotto Runs Through. And completely ignoring my final thoughts and just watching the (laughs) run through itself. That's why I film the way I do. So it puts you at the table. It's from your perspective. If if you can imagine having ridiculously hairy arms like I do, (laughs) you can imagine... I mean, actually, wow... Filming Rotter Runs Through is a VR thing where the whole thing, and you could actually just put on the helmet and then you're really at the table, except for my big, crazy, hairy arms. <laughs> my unfortunately hairy arms. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's the best I can do. That's why I film the way I do, because I think it gives a better understanding of what the game feels like to play. That's why I spend so much time articulating the types of decisions you have to make and the types of obstacles and hurdles and, and potential events that can happen so that you can decide whether it's going to work for you. And short of that, I mean, I try to film in such a way that it's as close as it can be for you to actually play the game. Because other than that, you got to play it. I don't know there is any other way. Uh, certainly not one that I've found. Let's see. Then, R- Richard T., not me. Let's see here. He's got a question in here somewhere. Just scanning for the question mark. It must be in here somewhere. I don't see it. Oh, my goodness. Now I've got to actually read the thing. Hey, Honey Pie, what are you doing? While I try to actually find the question in uh, Richard's email. I am gazing adoringly at our two puppy dogs. They are snoozing, and Daisy has her head on top of Gert's back. And they're both cuddled up into little balls. They're adorable. And other than that, I am going through email. Okay. I found his question. Actually, Richard spent a fair deal of time talking about how he's getting married. They're going on their honeymoon. Here's the types of games we like. Would we have any suggestions for games they could take? Richard, I'm sorry. You wrote this band. Man, you wrote this back on January 11th. Because we're. <laughs> um, I, I hope. I don't know if you've actually gone on this or not. But actually, if you go to faq.rado.com, I have an entry for this very thing. Not your wedding plans, but specifically, if anybody ever asks me, hey, can you recommend games? My response is always, well, go to faq.rado.com and I give you links that you can go to ask and get a better answer than just what I would come up with off the top of my head. It's, I mean, you've done a really good job here, kind of articulating what it is you like, but still, I'd have to 
spend 15, 20 minutes thinking about it and going on Board Game Geek and doing research and all that. I'm sorry, I just don't have the time, Richard. But go to faq.raw.com, follow the link, and you will find a place where you can ask people for these questions if it's not too late. If it is too late, well, congratulations. I hope you had a great marriage, wedding, and honeymoon. Moving on to Chris. Oh, I can spot the question mark right away. Does it seem that there are more reprints and re-implementations, second edition, third edition, etc., coming in 2017 than in previous years? And if so, what do I think about this trend? Nostalgia, lack of originality, uh, risk avoidance, etc., etc. What do you think? Ooh, that's a good question. You know what? I would have to go back and look. And I seem to recall somebody asked me this on Board Game Geek not too long ago, and I actually did sit down. And I actually took the 20 or 30 minutes to break down this year versus previous, or 2016 versus 2015, 2014, 2017. I don't think it is growing. I think you could see that there are more reprints and more implement, re-implementations happening because you're just seeing more games being published, period. The real question is, are you suggesting, is the ratio from new games to reprints sh- shifting? I don't think so. Not in any kind of appreciable way. It's just that there are more games being done across the board. As for why it happens, well, yeah, you listed it. Uh, you know, risk avoidance. Hey, if this was a successful game in the past, there's a lot of people who want it, we should publish it because it's a much less risky proposition. That's why Hollywood makes sequels and remakes of films. It's just good business sense. But no, I don't think there's a particular uptick. I think we've always had tons and tons of reprints relative to the non-reprints. I think the ratio is probably pretty similar. Although, I confound somebody to go to guild.rado.com and prove me wrong. Then, we move on to Daniel, who would like to know, did I ever break the rule of one playable character per person? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's plenty of games where we'll do it. I mean, we it's not our first choice, but... I mean, I've talked about this in the past. Uh, uh, Star Trek Expeditions. Occasionally, I play that solo, and I play all four characters. Um... We like claustrophobia a lot, where I play the Dungeon Master and Jen has to control four characters. Catacombs. I, again, play the Dungeon Master, but I control a whole bunch of bad guys, and Jen controls a whole bunch of good guys. Same, you know, same thing there. So yeah, there are games that do it. And why do we like it in some and not in others? Where we don't like it is a game... There's two main reasons we don't like it. It's a game that was clearly designed with a level of complexity and gameplay depth where each player is supposed to control one character. And to me, it's just the height of laziness for designers to say, oh, that's no problem. Just control four or five characters, two or three characters. Just do the work of three or four players. No big deal. When Those games I just mentioned, like Claustrophobia, it's designed from the ground up to have you as a... to have Jen control one group of heroes. And the perfect example of that is all those heroes share one common pool of items. Jen doesn't have to keep track of, all right, this character has three items, this character has five items, this character has no items. Right, wait, who's the one who had the grenade? Oh, crap, they're in the wrong room. And all this... No, it's... uh, Claustrophobia is brilliant. They just say all the heroes, wherever they are in the dungeon, doesn't matter. They all share this one common group of resources because it's designed from the ground up to be played where one player controls multiple characters. So in a game where it wasn't designed that way and then they just make you do it like, say, Fury of Dracula, it's a real turnoff. And then the other thing is a game where we want to feel a really strong connection to a character instead of feeling like a general who's controlling a bunch of characters, that's a problem. So I mentioned Star Trek Expedition because... I don't mind feeling like I'm the general of all these characters because I already love the characters. I love Kirk and Bones and Uhura and Scotty and Spock and all that. So I'm perfectly fine being a general in those circumstances. So that's kind of a rough guideline. Do you like the mechanism from Robinson Crusoe? Use more actions in order not to roll dice and automatically succeed. Sure, yeah, that's great. Um, It's about as good as roll to resolve can get. I mean, I'd still rather not do roll and resolve... And if it's going to be roll and resolve, I generally prefer a situation where, hey, I roll, and after the roll is over, I can decide to burn resources to succeed. Uh, most of the time, games don't do that. I don't remember if Robinson Crusoe does the more common thing, where, okay, we're about to roll. If I want to, I can take a gamble and burn a bunch of resources uh, so that I can bump up, I can get plus five to my roll even before I make it, and then I make it and find out, oh, I didn't need that at all. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. It's fine. It's a decent mitigation, but I'd much prefer the latter, which is almost never done, where it's more about the resource management. Hey, roll the die. Oh, that didn't work out. Fortunately, I have enough stuff on hand that I can go on ahead and get the thing done anyway. Um, yeah, so it's okay. 
But I'd still infinitely prefer alternate uses for dice. Dice that uh, define what types of actions you can take. Dice drafting, etc., etc., rather than roll and resolve. Let's see. Uh, but, oh, do I know of any games that have that mechanism? Oh my gosh, it's so common. Uh, um, we were just playing Arkham Horror, the card game today, which does exactly that. Just go to um, you go to guild.rao.com or just go to the general forum in Board Game Geek and ask, and people will list... There are hundreds of examples of games that do this. Let's see. What mechanisms would you prefer cooperative dungeon crawls have? Maybe pick certain mechanisms from certain games and make a Frankenstein's monster. Uh, co- cooperative dungeon crawls. Uh, I don't know. Cooperative mechanisms. I don't know. That's pretty picky. Uh, or you know, kind of... That's tough to say. I like all kinds of gameplay mechanisms. In fact, not too long ago I did. Or about last year, maybe the year before, I did a top 10 favorite gameplay mechanisms. Go look at those. Those are my 10 favorite mechanisms. I would like to see those in Dungeon Crawls. I would like to see those in every kind of game. <laughs> um, Dungeon Crawls are not particularly special in that regard to me. Which board gaming reviewer would you and Jen have fun playing games with? In your opinion, well, Jen couldn't answer that question at all. I mean, they're all fine. I mean, I can't think of who would I not enjoy playing games with is the, is the bigger question. Who would uh, see? Because I'm just going to by default say that you know if if they are personable enough that they can actually get on camera and make an entertaining product that I actually enjoy watching. Chances are I'll probably enjoy playing with them too because they're personable, outgoing people. So it's just an automatic win. What game reviewer, game show do I think I would not particularly enjoy playing games with? I am literally drawing a blank here. <sighs> because if, you know, if, if they have a not particularly fun, outgoing persona, they don't end up staying making videos for very long. Hmm. Yeah, I can't think of any. Sorry. Sorry. Do not have an answer. Okay, and with that, let's move on to Paul, who wants to know, how difficult do you think it is to create some fresh and innovative mechanism in a game? You have anything to say about that, Honey Pie? Extremely difficult. I agree. Extremely difficult. I I know it's a really common refrain that, you know, ideas are easy. Ideas are a dime a dozen. I don't find that to be the case at all. Something truly interesting and innovative and original that's that that's 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 gold dust. That's that's diamonds in the rough. Those are incredibly rare and uh, and 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 so much more work to actually turn them into something great cuz heck if nobody else has done it, you don't have a blueprint to follow. You don't have something to stand on the shoulders of to improve and innovate in and uh, iterate. So yeah, I think they're rare and I think they're tough to pull off. What are the top 3 games I would like to see a reprint of? You know what? I literally just did that top 10 the other day. Phew. <laughs> uh, um, so I can dodge that one. Let's see here. And oh, wait, Honey Pie, questions for you. Ooh. Oh, no, those go under the personal, so we'll come back to them later. Eric wonders mm. which board game personality has the most similar taste to me and Jen? Most similar taste to me and Jen. Well, it's going to be Euro. I mean, a, a, a surprisingly high number of board game video bloggers are very Ameritrash focused. Um, who would I say? Oh, uh, no pun included. I, although, you know, they're very Ameritrash focused too, but they've got a really strong... Would it be no pun intended? What did I say? No pun included. No, th- their name is no pun included. Okay. Um, See, I don't know. Yeah, you don't know. Okay. Jen doesn't know at all. Uh, but I th- well, actually, I have played with them, and I think uh, we've got a pretty good... We're pretty simpatico. Who else... Oh, man. These are tough questions. This is why I should research and find uh, the answer, but then that'd be a lot of work. Let me think. (laughs) Who else? Um, Ricky Royal, I suspect. Everything I've seen of him really uh, kind of fires on the same cylinders as me. Uh, So many of them, though, really kind of focus. I mean, I'd like to say shut up and sit down, guys, but they are so much more focused. I mean, actually, no. Of the shut up and sit down guys, Paul Dean... He's definitely the Eurocentric guy. He's the one who would like to play Agricola with you. So Paul Dean, Quinns, I mean, I think he'd be a great, fun guy to play with, but uh, he's just always wanting to, for the experience to be as much about the meta experience as it is about the game. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I think he's just focused on different stuff than me. But yeah, definitely Paul Dean. Definitely, definitely. Uh, Tiffany Ralph. 
Um, yeah, pretty much anyone that has a tendency towards Euros, I guess. Besides Board Game Geek, what board game resources do you use most or find very useful? None? None more? Uh, is there any other board game resource? I, I, I don't know. I look at Reddit a couple times a day. So I guess there's Reddit. And I mean, I've tried several times. The Oh, Board Game Prices is a great site for trying to find out if you're setting the right price for your game you're trying to sell. If you're setting up an auction or whatever. So Board Game Prices is awesome. See, let's actually look. Let's launch ye old browser and see what I actually have bookmarked in the board game category. Because I do have a subcategory for that. Let's see. So that's a, no, that's a Board Game Geek shortcut. That's board game prices. Um, the math trade tool. Although I don't do math trades as much as I used to do. But that's a hugely important one. There's Reddit. And... Oh, I guess Kickstarter, you could arguably. Yeah, I don't actually have very many. It's 99% Board Game Geek for me. Sorry to say. What do you consider was the best year in board gaming? The game, the year with the most quality releases. I would almost always say the year we're in. Because the industry is just getting bigger and better and bolder. More people are coming in with more fresh new ideas. More people are discovering old ones and finding new ways to tweak and improve and innovate on old designs. Uh, it's just we're in an explosive, expansive, exponentially growing uh, time in the industry. I mean, I think you might have had a high watermark two years ago for 2015, specifically because of Pandemic Legacy, because that was such an amazing year. But and you know, in two, if but if Gloomhaven had come out in 2016, I'd put 2016 above 2015. As this 2017 is probably going, I mean, it's getting Pandemic Legacy too. Is getting Gloomhaven. Is getting Charterstone. Is getting so many great things. I, my answer to that is always going to is almost always going to be the current year. What have you considered? Having guests or co-hosts on Rado talks through. Uh, well, I've got Jen, Yay. Honey Pie. Apparently, Hello. you're not good enough for Eric here. <laughs> uh, I've considered it, but it's just so much work. I did the very, very first one I ever did. I, I my original, yeah, I'm going to have a guest every month. It's going to be great. But that was, I mean, and I did with a guy who was. Oh yeah, we talked about. Making a game cafe, that's what it was, because he was in the process of, f- of funding a game cafe. And, and that was really interesting, man. I enjoyed talking to him about it. But it's just so much work. And, you know, I've got the formula down now. You know, heck, half of, the, half of the podcast is just answering questions. So I'm a lazy guy when it boils right down to it. So anything that's less work is generally going to be the path I follow. So it's probably not something that's going to happen to you very often. How many years must go by until you update your top 10, top 20 of all time? <laughs> How many years? How many years? Oh, dear. I, I don't know if I'll ever... You know, quite frankly, I don't think my top 10 has changed in the la- since I did it. Because my top 10 very, very, very rarely ever changes. And I don't see the point of doing it anyway. Because anytime you want, you can go to ranked.rado.com or games.rado.com, and you can instantly see my top 300. I have everything constantly up to date, and sort. whenever I play a new game enough to decide how much I like it, I rank it compared to every other game I've ever played. I just do that as I go. If I were to do a top 10 right now, I don't think it has actually changed. Gloomhaven might push its way in, but I don't think it's going to. I haven't actually played the final yet. And, yeah, I mean... I, What's gonna? What, I mean, what's gonna push Pelopines out of my top ten? I don't know that there is anything. I haven't played anything better than Pelopines yet. So it's it's there's not reason there's no reason to do it too terribly often. I don't think. So that was it for Eric. Moving on to Tom. Tom says he was wondering. Uh, I've had a prototype run through me. Thanks. In your prototype run through, I okay. He started talking. All right. So this is weird. Tom, I don't understand. Thanks for highlighting this in your prototype run through so many months ago. Highlighting what? Tom, you're not. Oh, oh, there's an attached picture. Ah, 
All right. Oh, it's Gloomhaven. Hey, I was just talking about Gloomhaven. All righty. <laughs> Thanks for highlighting Gloomhaven, which was in the attached picture. Excited to break in. Hopefully, you'll get your copy. I just got my copy two weeks ago, and we couldn't play it because Jen was gone. So it's just, I was so happy to actually find room for it, room for it myself. Honey, you see that box down there in the bottom left corner that looks like it's three boxes wide? Yes. It's, cra- it's all one box. It's my ridiculous. goodness, it is a big one. Yep, I didn't think I was going to find room for it. Do you plan to do a talk-through update? I, I, I imagine I probably will eventually, but I don't know when because, I mean, I forget. I think I played like, I, I played one with Jen, and then I played like two or three more because I just had like a, a random assortment of missions back when I did the run through a while ago. Now I've got the whole thing. But it, you know, for a game that offers whatever five hundred hours of gameplay or something crazy like that, I mean, you have to put a sizable dent into it. I mean, we didn't do our Pandemic Legacy video until we finished two thirds of it. Finishing two thirds of Gloomhaven that's going to take me years. So I don't know when it's going to happen, but I intend to. It's just a matter of finding the time to play it first. All righty. Question for the next podcast. Given the lengthy campaign, will you have the time to give this... Oh, hey! <laughs> will I have the time to play it dozens of times? To Yeah, I mean, that's the question. I don't know. I, I look forward to playing it, and it's just a question of being able to find the time to do it. Moving on to Mark. How do we, where do we stand on sleeving? I have to admit, I'm not a fan of sleeving. I am. Jen is... Oh, well, apparently Jen would like to weigh in. I do not like sleeved cards, but Jen does because... I just... I prefer them. I, they don't stick together. Yeah, they, they do. are easy to shuffle. Well, depending on the quality of the sleeves. Okay. Apparently yeah. we get good quality sleeves because I <laughs> don't recall a problem. I, I like them. No, I don't like... I, I, I prefer literally the tactile feel of cards in my hands rather than plastic in my hands. And, um, you know, if they're not high quality sleeves and a lot of the ones we have are low quality they kind of the, the the cards can get stuck together they can clump just as much as they might do under the worst mm. of shuffling and yeah i mean i just prefer the feel of cards and i think it's more fun to actually riffle <laughs> shuffle than to just what i don't know what you call it where you just kind of smoosh them together i'm gonna call it the smoosh shuffle. yeah the smoosh shuffle of uh, so but apparently i mean i mean you don't care about them in terms of why most people sleep which is to protect the very, very delicate cards so that they will last for a thousand years. No. I mean, I don't care about that at all. I mean, to me, I don't know. I, I kind of feel bad putting in their sleeves. I mean, no, but they're meant to be touched. Mm. They're yeah. meant to be fondled. It's like, yeah, don't save your crystal for special days. Use it every day. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, Tom, he goes on to say he's obsessive about sleeving, but a lot of people love it or hate it. And, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to say I hate it, but I, I, just, I would rather I not. And I'm not going to say I love it. I just, yeah. I think sometimes there's some that have like purple backs. You get the clear front and the purple back. Yeah. I like that. Why? What do you care? Because it's pretty. <laughs> oh, because well, you, you, some of the sleeves out there, honey, are gorgeous. I mean, there are sleeves that it's not just a solid purple back, but there's like special art and stuff. I mean, mm. there's t- there's tons of you know, there, there's a big sleeves. sleeving industry. Which Jen <laughs> apparently, oh no, I, we should not have asked this no. question. I'm doomed. Yeah. All right, Mark's second question. Um, he's got issues with availability of games, driving purchases, and he's scared of missing opportunities um, for games that might disappear. He's driven into impulse purchases when he sees stock getting low. Have I ever bought a game for this reason? Have I have ever missed out on buying a game that is now difficult to find? Um, I don't think I've ever sought out a game because... No, actually, is that true? Yeah, there's, I guess there's a couple of times. For a while, I was... Really, oh, what's it called? The the Ragnar Brothers, the you know the guys who did Poseidon's Kingdom, and I want to say the Ragnar Brothers, but I might be mixing them up with a couple of other brothers. They're all British. So for a while, I was really keen on that, but then I realized I just wasn't enjoying their games enough, so I stopped doing it. And I realized, you know, who cares? It's just it's one less game. I mean, there's already three hundred and almost four hundred games on this wall. I don't need to have every single game that's out there. If there's a game that I I can't play, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. I mean, a lot of the games I do run-throughs for when they're in prototype form, I never end up getting. And I knew I loved them, but if they don't end up showing up, if the publisher doesn't send me a final copy, you know, at this point, I've got enough games. If I never got another new game for the rest of my life at this point, I've got 380-some games that I absolutely adore to death. I could play these game, I could play one of these games every day for the rest of my life. 
and not run out of cool, exciting experiences. So if there's a game out there I just can't get, I let it go. I used to be really obsessive about chasing after every single promo. So much so that I started the worldwide promo math trade, and I ran it for a few years until I eventually realized, man, this is a lot of work. And I don't need every promo. I do not need to obsessively get 100% completion. It's not like I'm getting achievement points for this. It's just (laughs) not necessary. So I have... Maybe I felt that somewhat in the past, but I have shed that skin, definitely. If if it's it's a game and I hear about it and I can't get it, I say, oh, that's too bad. I got plenty of other games. That's pretty much where I come down. Alrighty. So, what is the best way to introduce non-gaming wife to Pandemic? Played Suburbia a few times. Played Agricola a couple times. Played some Castles of Burgundy. Think they would like um, Pandemic. But would In the Lab be too complex for first playthrough? Yes. Definitely. Do not go straight into... I mean, In the Lab is by far the most complex expansion there is. Now, don't get wrong. From what you said, I mean, heck, if, if you're... Oh, no, no, you said it's a it's family version of a curricula. No, 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 no. Do not go directly into In the Lab. Just start Pandemic the way everybody starts Pandemic. Just the base game. You know, either pl- played either at easy or normal difficulty, depending on what your guys' skill level is. Uh, that's how we started. I think that's the best way to go. Do you, uh, do you play Pandemic with hands face up, always visible, or closed hands but lots of discussion? Open. Yes, this is a point of contention between me and Jen. I prefer to play the proper way where you're not just supposed to put all your cards on the table and you're supposed to actually talk a bit more about it. Um, But Jen prefers just to be able to see all my cards so she can just do all her own computations. Yeah, I'm efficient. What can I say? (laughs) He has a hard time with me too because when we play story games and I'm trying to summarize what's on the card, what was that... um, Oh, you mean time stories? Yeah, like oh, time, time stories. stories. Yeah, yeah. I can't seem to just tell him the story. <laughs> I want to read him the card <laughs> because it's more efficient. Yeah, it's just easier. Yeah. No, yeah, I, but I, yeah. So Jen prefers playing open, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's interesting. Officially, with Pandemic Legacy, they took that rule out of the rule book. In regular Pandemic, honey, I mean, yeah. not that you care, but it is an official rule that I'm not supposed to let you see my cards. I mean, it's as simple. I can tell you every single card I've got in my hand. I can't remember all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but I'm not supposed to. That's the point. The reason that rule is in Pandemic is because in some groups, people, you'll, you'll end up playing oh. with somebody who quarterbacks yeah. or becomes the alpha gamer and just tells everyone what to do if they can just see what everything is. Yeah. And so this is a hedge against that. Oh, you can't see what the cards are. You can talk to me and you can ask me, hey, could you help that? And, I can, and now I can actually be part of the give and take. And I mean, I prefer that. Not, be, I mean, not, Jen or I. I don't think either of us are particularly alpha gamerish. No. I mean, we both talk. We're, we're both al- We're both equally alpha. We're both equally <laughs> take chargey. Yeah, unless uh, it's, it's something particular that's your strength, or if it's my strength. I think I think there are give and take. Some games I'm probably more alpha than you are, and vice versa. Well, who's more alpha in pandemic then? Probably me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> I'm organized. <laughs> so there you go, folks. That's why we play open hand. Because Jen's the boss. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's true. I, well, here's the thing. No, here's the actually interesting thing. I, I, actually, I, I believe you're right. As I'm thinking about having played through Pandemic Legacy twice now. Yeah. Once just you and me and once you, me, and two other people. Yeah. And um, I think, yeah, you're probably a bit more alpha. Although anybody who watches the, any of my run-throughs just assumes I'm the alpha. Yeah. But that's just because I'm talking to keep yeah. patter going on the camera and everybody else gets really quiet. But... I would definitely say you're more alpha But I think what's interesting is, I mean, you just really drill down and you become focused on this thing and um, you, know, you come up with your plans. And as often as not, they're really good plans. But I Wait, think the main more, thing more I bring... More often than not, they're really good plans. Yeah, yeah. No, get wrong. You know, I should say they're always as, really good thank plans. You. There you go. But <laughs> I think the main thing I do is I will often just say, well, wait, 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 wait. What about this? And I think I tend to come up with the really kind of far out things that aren't just more kind of by the numbers. I mean, um, you know, or the, the more, well, you know what? If we did this, yeah. I mean, I know that's really not what this character normally does. Because again, your heightened use for efficiency means, okay, that meta cannot be used for anything other than taking care of cubes. Yep. You know, that dispatcher cannot be used for anything other than moving everybody else around. But I'll say, you know what, maybe the medic doesn't need to pick up those cubes because they're really close to here. And, you know, I mean, so I think I probably come up with a bit more of the 
outside, you know, you know, kind of the the rules breaking. I I mean, you, you're more conventional and straightforward because you just have that heightened. I must use everybody to peak efficiency, whereas I'll just kind of go. I'll paint outside the lines. Yeah. Well, and oftentimes you're the one that's, that sees it. Well, hold on. We're, we're about to run out of yellow cubes. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, because you're, you're I don't peak care. Efficiency. We're going we're gonna to cure and eradicate blue. <laughs> so there. That is what I set into motion three rounds ago. Yep. And that's what we're going to do. Yep. Honey, I think we might want to put that on hold for a little yeah, bit. the yellow cubes. Yeah. We really like pandemic. We do love it. Yes. Yep. Um, so anyway, uh, there you go. I would prefer playing with closed hands, but we, we never really do. Um. Do you play Pandemic with hands? Oh, no, you just asked that question. Would you choose roles randomly? Oh, no, we always choose randomly, 100% randomly. We do not select uh, or draft them or anything like that. We do not care to always use the Medic. <laughs> um, you know, If we get the Medic, great. If we don't get the Medic, it's, for us, it's part of the puzzle and the fun of the game is yep. figuring out how to make these two characters work yeah, based think, on what's going on in the world. I don't think we'd love it quite as much if, if we always use the same characters because it would get a little bit stale. Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree. All right, that was it for Mark. Cat wonders, have we played the jewelry box expansion for Rococo? Answer, no, and I honestly don't know why. I tried to get a review copy from, what was it, Pegasus, Pegasus Spila, and so, I just don't know what happened. It slipped between the cracks. I'd really like to give it a go. We really like Rococo, but it just I never ended up getting a copy. It's just one of those ones that slipped between the cracks. And who knows, maybe now it's out of print. Ah, Well, if it is, it is. I'd definitely like to try it, because Rococo is really cool. That's the dressmaking game? Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, but yeah. I, I just wanted to say I like anything with the word Coco in it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see here. Fabian Honey Pie yeah. uh, has questions from Switzerland. Oh. Okay. Are they cold? He's learning. Uh, he's learned about time stories, <clears throat> and he loved it. It's a success. Yay. The family loves it. Is there anything from another game, theme, mechanism, component, that you would love to see in a future? Oh, Honey Pie. What would you like to see in future time story expansions? Oh, I wish people would stop asking me these questions. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. Well, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just want to see more interesting, unique settings. Yeah, I mean, I, it's time stories for heaven's sake. Let's do some time travel. With well, it's interesting. Different... I mean, um, they they while you were gone, they announced the next. They've already announced the next one, which was going to be set in medieval Spain, and but they've announced the other two, and one of them is Pirates of the Caribbean, and one of them is. I don't remember what, but it was equally... Oh, no. Uh, 80s, set in Hollywood in the 80s. And they didn't say what it was, but it kind of sounds like a detective film noir type. Hmm. You know, or, you know, a, a, you know, a noir type detective. That's what I'm assuming it is. They didn't really say much. And those are both fine. I mean, hey, yeah, a detective story. That's really cool. If it is a detective story, they didn't say. It's just set in the 80s in, the, in Hollywood. Uh, and pirates, sure. Yeah, who doesn't love that? But I would like to see so much more variety. I mean... I would love to see a game set in Australia when it was a penal colony. I've never seen a game. I've never seen a movie. I've never seen a TV show. I've never seen anything about that. But it had to be an incredibly fascinating time in history. And your know, entire country um, you know, being populated. I would love to see a Time Stories story set in, set in South America during the Spanish colonization. Told from the point of view of the indigenous people. Yeah. That would be amazing. Yeah. I want to see time stories tell stories that completely open up my eyes as opposed to more things about pirates. Because I've heard a lot about pirates and pretty much every other topic that time stories has done so far. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, so I would love to see time stories literally set in Neolithic man. I, I would love to jump into that. And, um, you know, and, and what does that mean in terms of communication and, and stuff like that? I think that'd be amazing to, you know, live a day in the life of Neolithic man. Uh, you know, I want to see stuff like that. I want to see really outside the box stories, not more retreading of common tropes. I was so excited about the Antarctic one, you know, based on what I thought it was going to be. And then I found out what it was. And while we still enjoyed it, it was like, oh... Man, it could have been something really different mm. instead of what it ultimately turns out to be. So I want to see really far out stuff. But I want to see any of them. Um, I'm not, you know, so far, we haven't had a bad time story experience. You got nothing. You can't think of a single time in history you would like to go and explore. I like your idea of, of telling it from the loser's mm -hmm. point of view. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, instead of history is always told by the winner. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean the same thing... 
I, I, I imagine they'll eventually do an American West one. And that'll be cool. And it'll be neat to be cowboys and, and chase after rustlers and all that stuff. But I'd be just interested in one that's basically just... I would love to see one set in the time of the Native Americans before European settlers showed up. Yeah. I think that would be amazing. Or how about even just you're, uh, you're a person in the town who has to run the saloon or something and all the challenges. Oh, yeah. Instead of being the typical cowboy sure. or sheriff or something like that. Just somebody living their life. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I think kind of stuff that, that, that stuff would be amazing. Because Time Stories doesn't have to be about fighting and shooting. Um, you know, I mean, it's what it boils right down to. It's always just about rolling dice to overcome challenges. I mean, yeah, you could have it overcoming a challenge <laughs> just being trying to charm people at your bar. Yep. Um, yeah. Didn't so, come back. So, speaking of components, most and least favorite component in all the games you've ever played and still remember. I mean, what is the coolest game component-wise you can think of off the top of your oh, head? Oh, I love the the tower. <laughs> the the cube tower in America. Yeah. Okay. I also love Zolkin's the um, the dial big things. dial in yeah, Zolkin. I yep. Love that. All right. Um, in fact, I just love gadgets like that. Any yeah. game that has a gadget. See, but that's the thing. You're loving those. I mean, those actually aren't re- particularly high quality, really cool. It's not like they're translucent cubes that you can see. And I mean, when, when he says components, can you oh. think of a game that's like, wow, this is so pretty. This is so, oh, I just want to reach out and touch it. I see it on the table and I want to play it. Because both those examples were great, but you love those because of the gameplay. Well, and I love the gadgetry of it. But, yeah. Um, oh. Well, of course, if you're looking at beautiful components, you would you would say to yourself, some gorgeous glass ones would be awesome, of course. <laughs> um, but I'm trying to think of component. Well, we just played that bees game that had the little bees that are erasers. Ah, but that's that only really for the prototype. Fun. It's not going to have that for the final thing. I know, but I'm just saying that springs to mind because we just played it. Mm-hmm. Bees! <laughs> um Oh, that's hard. I mean, I'm looking at our wall of games, and I just can't even begin to think of all the yeah. components in every one of those. Well, you remember the Mechs versus Minion that had those little mechs and you know, the army of little minions that would rush in, and they, the mechs were pre-painted? Yeah, or... and you put your guy on top of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, those were cool. Or the, uh, you know, the, the disc-flicking game with the really cool discs. I don't know. I mean, someday I'll do a top ten components, I suppose. Least favorite components, I don't know. I've got a couple of, like, oh, probably, probably Paperclip Railways, probably. But you know what? Actually, I just did a top 10 games that need reprints. And the big thing, one of the big things I was talking about in there was components. So go look at my top 10 games that need a reprint, and, and, and you'll see my least favorite components in games. I think, because I think they need reprints. Yeah, little paper components that aren't ni- on like, yeah. thick cardboard, Exactly, yeah, that kind of thing. Those kinds of things. Mm. 2016 New Year resolution for, for uh, Fabian. Was that his name? Well, Fabian, yes. I hope it's really 2017 because we're really... Oh, no, he sent this on February 1st of 2017. Yeah. He's talking about his 2016 resolution oh. was to get his mother and sister back into tabletop gaming. But he's still struggling. Um, established a semi-regular, almost once a week play session. But whenever I asked them if they're up for a game this coming weekend, the response is, eh. So the question is, how to get people to watch less TV and play more games? Ooh. I got Prizes. A, what's that? Prizes. <laughs> Prizes. So he has to come up with a prize for his mom and his sister. If you, if you get excited about this, I'll do the dishes. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. I suppose that's one solution. Actually, that could be very good because women tend to be busy with crap that isn't fun. And yeah. if you take some of the crap that isn't fun out of their lives, they might have more time to do fun stuff with them. There you go. There's your answer, Fabian. My other suggestion I was going to say <laughs> is ask them. Oh, communicate? Just don't ask me. <laughs> ask them. <laughs> you know, like, presumably, you, you do apparently have a semi-regular almost once a week play session. Hey, that's great. That's a good start. After you have a play session and it goes really well and you clearly had fun, just before they walk away, ask them, hey... You clearly had fun. Why is it you're always so hesitant to want to play games? And get them to tell you. <laughs> That's all I can say. All righty. Dave, honey pie, wonders, do we say particular game for run through during the... Well, okay, this is for... During the time of year that Jen is gone for a while. Hmm. Uh, maybe games that she wouldn't like. No, not necessarily. I mean, I, I pretty much try to cover games as fast as they come in. Well, certainly prototype games, I have to cover them fast because they're gonna, they have timers with Kickstarter. And um, other games, the way I prioritize all games pretty much has nothing to do with whether Jen is coming or going. If a publisher 
gave me a review copy of it rather than me buying it, it gets prioritized over any game that I actually bought with my own money. There's probably 30... If you go to unfilmed.rado.com, which is a list of every single game I've got in this house that I haven't done a run-through for, at any given time, there's usually around 100 games or so. Probably about 30% of those are almost maybe even 40 or maybe... No, probably more like 30 or 40% of those are ones that I myself have bought. Those are at the bottom of the priority list because I feel obligated. If somebody actually gave me a review, a review copy of the game, I got to do those first. So that's my first prerequisite. My second prerequisite, is there some kind of timer associated with this? Most notably, some kind of Kickstarter campaign or pre-order window or something like that. So those get prioritized first. Then, of all the other ones that have been you know, given to me as review copies... The prioritization, uh, its next highest one, is going to be voters. You know, four games every month are chosen by the voters or by thumbs off the request geek list. After that, after a short time and then priorities, I think uh, my next priority is just ones I think will enjoy the most. But really, those first two priorities probably represent 80% of all the games I actually film in a given month, more than likely. And uh, you know the only way games that I that I actually bought get filmed is if somebody requests it as a co-host thing or it gets enough thumbs. Uh, that's pretty much how you ever see me covering an older game. It's because it's been on the request list long enough and it's pushed its way to the top of the thumbing. Righty. Um, do I cover more games or less while Jen is gone? In previous years, it's more. I mean, when Jen's been gone in the past, I've done a game a run through a day. But 2017, I'm trying to slow down. I'm trying not to kill myself. Because if I, if, I, if I keep pushing so hard, I'll just have to stop doing this altogether. Um, so I'm trying to slow down. So at this point, I'm trying to target, on average, three videos a week. That seems pretty reasonable to me. And that's pretty much what I did while Jen was gone. It's pretty much what I'm going to try to do now that she's back. When you finish filming a game, do you ever finish them off camera? Mm, almost never. Almost never. As soon as I... You know, mm-hmm. you know, I always finish halfway, a quarter of the way into the game. Do I keep going? Almost never. Even cooperative games. Even cliffhanger games. I know some people get to the end like, oh my god, I can't believe that cliffhanger. Tell me who won in the virtual sense. I'm like, I don't know. I stopped playing. I I got (laughs) away and put the game away and got the next game out and started reading the rules because it's just an assembly line here, as Jen will confirm. Yep. Um, Let's see. And All right, so that was it. He has some non-gaming questions. We'll come back to those later. Next up, we have a, a question from another Richard. How many Kickstarter projects do you run through... Um, or how many how many Kickstarter projects that I run through go on to be fully funded? I would say almost all of them. And the reason for that, I mean, some people say, "Oh, yeah, he's being a bit of braggadocio because yeah, if I do a run through, that means it's going to succeed." That's not the case. If I do a run through, it's a really good game because believe me, I get I say no to nine out of every ten games that people ask. You know, people say, I'm going to be doing this on Kickstarter. Could you do a run-through? I ask them to send me the rules. I read the rules. I understand whether it's a good game based on that. And I say no almost every single time. So when I say yes, I'm pretty confident it's a good game. Otherwise, I wouldn't want to waste my time or Jen's time playing it. And I'm pretty confident most games that are good will get funded as a general rule. It doesn't always happen, but it probably happens 90% of the time. Using tracking software, is there a noticeable increase in activity on projects after you release your run-through? Per- maybe, but here's the thing. I always try really, really hard to make sure my run-through is there day one, hour one of the campaign, because that's where it does the most good. Because here's the thing. Um, I want every one of these campaigns to succeed. Not because I was paid. Once again, for people who accuse me of being a shill. Um, I'm not a shill. I don't get paid for these things. Um, Sometimes I really, really, really hope they succeed because I hopefully want to get a copy of the final thing because I never keep any of the prototypes. The prototypes always end up given away to people who visit or whatever. And so, yeah, I want everyone to succeed just because... I want everybody to succeed. I don't want anybody to fail. That's terrible. It's horrible. It's awful. I mean, I know how every one of these games is a passion labor of love. So I do my best to try to make sure my video is there on hour one because that's when it's going to have the most impact. Because the number one thing a Kickstarter campaign can do to be successful is have a strong start. The psychology that goes into people backing Kickstarter campaigns is so weird. It makes no sense to me at all. But it's pretty consistent and predictable. If you have a strong opening you're going to end well. If you have a weak opening, doesn't matter. I don't people just, "Oh, it had a weak opening. I won't back." That makes no sense to me because you can back anyway. 
The more people who back, the more momentum there is, the more likely it is to be successful. If it's not successful, you don't have to pay. I never understand why people don't. But if people don't see a strong opening, if people don't see that funded in the first 48 hours, they'll just say, ah, there's the, you know, there must be something wrong with the game. I'm not even going to look into it. It's weird. It becomes self-fulfilling prophecies. Those are so rampant in Kickstarter. So that's why I try really, really hard to make sure I'm there day one. So I can't really answer your question. David would like to know, um, Jen is blue, Rado is green. If those colors are not available, what second or third or, heaven forbid, fourth choice? Oh my. Well, purple's always first for me. Yeah, purple is her first. Blue is Jen's first backup when it blows right down to yeah, it. Yeah, there you go. Um, I like... I don't think we've ever had a case where you couldn't be blue. What would, be you, go, what would you go to next? Oh, uh, I don't know. If there's uh, kind of a... I like teal, but that's too close to green, probably. So, yeah. And you get anything green. Um, I don't know. I tend to go for raspberry or something like that kind of a color. don't pretty really like pink. Um, I like white. Anything sparkly <laughs> or glittery or metallic. All right. Yeah. All right. There you go. What's your? What would be at the bottom of your list of colors? Brown. Brown. Any shade of brown. Any shade of brown. And by association, orange. I don't know. There's this kind of a salmony orange color I do like, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, brown definitely. Yeah. I probably wouldn't go for black. Yep. Yeah. All right. I'm a color kind of girl. Yeah. So um, yeah, I my first choice is always green. My second choice is yellow. My third choice is orange. Um, and my fourth choice would be, at that point, it doesn't really matter. Honestly, I mean, I don't really care. It's, I don't need to be green. I just choose green because if I'm not green and somebody else is green, I will just, out of habit, move their stuff. Yep. Uh, it's, it's, it's totally practical. <clears throat> I mean, I'm, 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 I'm happy with any color. It's just that if green's on the table and I'm not it, it's just going to make the game tougher to play. <laughs> Let's see. What was our first Feld game? I believe our first Feld game was... Notre Dame. Okay. Which, I don't know if you remember, Notre Dame is the one where we're building Notre Dame, but every time we ever play, you always just drive around like a crazy person in your carriage. I love my carriage. Just zipping around from place to place. You're yeah. Like, I need Notre Dame and the plague and help with the people. Uh, sorry, I'm going to be out of my carriage. Whee! <laughs> you lap the whole board like four times every time we played. You get every single spot. You just love riding that carriage. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure uh, it was our first. Let's see here. Next up, Ian Wonders... If you think we're likely to see a fundamental board game mechanism come along anytime soon, and I'm assuming he means like Dominion or whatever, most recent evolution of basics, workplaces, um, whether or not you think legacy is a mechanism or not, that seems to be the most recent trend. Risk legacy is six years old, though. So what do I think is the likelihood of a new, I mean, you know, like, a, you, mean, you mean a game changer? I don't know. Tom Vassell talked about this at one point, and he made an argument that a game changer happens once every five years, I think. Or something like that. And he, he talked about um, Agricola or you know, uh, Dominion. And before that, there was I don't know, El Grande or something. I don't remember what. I remember him talking about this. And I thought, oh, well, he did the research. Okay, it sounds good to me. Um, yeah, they come around every few years. But, yeah, I, you know, those once-in-a-lifetime game changers, they're tough to come up with. So I don't think it's particularly surprising. And I would expect it's reasonable to assume that moving forward... We'll see the, you know, the, the delta, the gap between them will get longer and longer because, you know, well, sooner or later, everything's going to have been done. But that's still a long ways off. All righty. Let's see here. Hey, honey, mm. Rose has a question for you. Oh, is it Rose? Uh, it's, it's Rose, but I don't know Rose's last name, and I'm not going to say this because yeah, yeah. I'm trying to maintain some level of anonymity. Okay. But it could be Rose. Probably is Rose. If it's Rose. Honey Pie. Hi, Rose. Jen says, hi, Rose. And Rose, honey pie, wants to know, given how you feel about Mr. Jack, which was, you don't even remember it now. Yeah, I think but it's Jack the, the Ripper one. Okay, you do. Well, that, that proves how she feels about it. Um, well, how much, about, but how much you both like the Sherlock Holmes consulting detective game, which is the one where we read through all the stories and whatnot. What are your thoughts about Sherlock Holmes consulting detective, Jack the Ripper, and West End Adventures? It is a new version of that. But um, I believe we are still playing, you know, the Baker Street Irregulars. Yeah. But we are actually, I mean, there's a series of adventures that at the end of it, there's like a meta story that's read throughout it that has to do with stopping Jack the Ripper once and for all. How would you feel about that? Seeing as how you've never heard of it before this very second. Yeah. Um, 
I really have a problem with women being victimized. Mm -hmm. It makes me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And it robs the fun factor. It definitely robs the fun factor. And while I certainly approve of stopping such things from happening, it's not like you're a prude. It's not like you say, oh my gosh, I can't believe they make this subject matter. This is. Of, you know, offending. It's just no, you it's, can't have fun playing it. No, it's it's pers- it's very uncomfortable for yeah, me. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so before anybody gets concerned, I have never been abused or um, <laughs> you know slashed or any of that kind of stuff. So it's not that I am having bad flashbacks or anything like that. I just I just feel very uncomfortable with that mm-hmm. subject. Yep. So even if I mean if, uh, you would probably not be interested in even in this subject matter. No, I don't think so. Yep. There you go. Fair enough. Rose. Good question. Moving on to Mark. You uh, see here. What modules do you play Sealand with? None. Sealand has modules. I, I have to admit, I haven't played Sealand since I did the run through for it. Sealand was something we played back when we were in England, so we had it in England. Uh, we have only played it once here in Malta. So I, I can't answer just because it's been so long because I don't get to go back and uh, revisit my faves. Favorite roll and write. Games where you roll dice and have to actually scratch stuff down on a piece of paper and pencil. I'm trying to remember. Do, is there such a thing? Yeah, of course. Like roll through the ages, the Lagranha. A game where you roll and re-roll and re-roll your dice and then you keep track of your progress by marking things on a piece of paper. Okay. I was thinking about the kind where you actually put your dice in the little container and then you use that action and then you're done. So, yes. Um, yes. Sounds like you've developed a new gameplay mechanism. It might be a game changer, honey. No, no, I don't know it, what you're talking about. It, it, the, um, the, it's a dungeon crawler. You're, you you're to, thinking of claustrophobia, yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. No. Um, well, what does that have to do with writing? That's what I was thinking. Is I didn't, I, that was what my mind instantly went to. Okay, no. Um, can you, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, can you think of, I mean, there's, uh, there's a the bunch question? of them. What's the favorite? Oh. Favorite role and write? Uh, <sighs> probably, in all honesty, Probably the first one we ever played, yeah, which would be that, roll, um, not roll figure out. It would be uh, roll through the ages. Yeah, with the uh, the wheat and the yeah, yeah, yep, and the the, spe- the custom dice that are made out of wood. Uh, the Lagranha one is really good as well. Um, oh, Avenue. That's the new one where oh, but it's, it isn't roll. Avenue is it's the one where you look at a card and it says oh, it's going to be a it's going to be a diagonal, you know, a northwest. And, we're, and we keep on drawing, and you know, we have to draw all oh, the, yeah, connect yeah, all yeah. things. Yep. That's really good, but you don't roll dice in that. So, yeah, I'm just going to go with roll through the ages. Okay. Maybe second place Lagranha. Huh? Any chance you'll be at Dice Tower Con? No, I'm afraid not. All righty. And let's see here. Moving on, we then have Mark again, but a different Mark. Oops, moved back to Roses. All righty. Let's see here. Where? Oh, this is a long one. Where's the question mark? <laughs> Theme, enticing. Handpipe, what are you doing? Stall while I read this. Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking at my Etsy shop. <laughs> All right. So, tell, tell people what you're seeing. Oh, uh, I've got things I've got to make starting oh. tomorrow. Yeah, you got a month's worth of stuff. Yeah, you've fallen behind that's on. That's very lovely. I'm very pleased. Um, yes, so I will tell you, though, Let's that see. we have just discovered antlers for dog chews. I know that doesn't have anything to do with games, but um, I picked one up in the States, and both girls have been so excited by it. And Daisy's just right now decided to get off the couch. No more cuddling. There is some antler chewing to be done. She's happy as a clam over there, working on that antler. So there you go. That was some filler. Okay. (laughs) Um, All right. He knows that I've I've often answered the question of what kind of game would you design that I wouldn't do it. So he knows that. What about if you could commission your dream game and have it arrive 12 months later on your doorstep? What would you, um, who would you get to design it, your dream game? What theme would you choose? What gameplay mechanisms? Would it be a co-op, multiplayer, solitaire, etc.? Um, he has a prediction that it would be Steffenfeld set in a fantasy setting with multi-use cards, card drafting, and dice worker placement. Fantastic! Somebody get <laughs> Steffenfeld to make that game. <laughs> No, uh, if I could just snap my fingers and make a game happen, what I would like to see, because it's, it's, if I were to design a game, it's, it would be what I would try to design because it's what I'm interested in. I would like to see 
Uh, um, it would be competitive, which is surprising. Although I'd love to... See, it would be great as a cooperative, too. But I think it'd be better as a competitive game. I would like to see a game, uh, an economic simulation, because those are what we tend to like, where players take on radically different roles with very, very different requirements for what is needed to be done in this economy. Like one player is an importer. One player is a merchant. One player is a manufacturer. And... Um, all players are trying to score the most points to get the most victory, but everything they do is, you know, if, if Jen takes on the role of manufacturer um, or distributor or whatever, and I'm a storefront merchant, I don't have anything to sell if Jen doesn't make stuff. So I, I love that idea of that kind of interdependency between players. I haven't seen, there, I've seen games like it. Fallen City Carez kind of did it, but it, it had a really big focus on dungeon crawling, and I didn't like that kind of stuff, but I really like the interdependency. I would love to see an, um, a true economic simulation with players who have radically different games. Like, what was it? What Vast came out last year, which was a very, very cool idea. It's a dungeon crawl where one player is the knight, one player is the goblins, one player is the dragon, one player is the dungeon itself, and they all have different goals, but they all kind of work in this same ecosystem. I love that idea, but I would like to see that applied to an economic simulation. Um, and yeah, I think it'd be awesome if Stefan Feld would make that. Although I don't think it really, I mean, he tends to make more, I don't think he'd be well suited for it. Maybe, uh, Christoph Bollinger, he'd be a really good fit for something like that based on Archipelago. Uh, he might make a lot of sense. So maybe something like that. Do you have, you're not going to commission a game right now, honey pie? Nope. Just going to go back to Etsy? All right. That's it. You don't want to come up with something creative on the fly? Uh, no. No. All right. Sean or scene. No. It's always Sean, right? It's Does always ever... Sean. It's yeah. never Cian. They never, never Cian. It just looks like Cian. I know. Okay. He's been playing Magic the Gathering for over 20 years. Wow. And <gasps> I guess that's true. Oh, you're just saying, wow, it's been around that long? My gosh. Well, I was just thinking we were playing it when we were like in Seattle. So, yep. yeah. Wow. Yep. Um, let's see. And he's still a competitive player living in London, but he wants to know. He's recently purchased the game Codex and appreciates its sophisticated design and balance from Serlin Games. So there's a big shout out to Serlin Games from Sean, professional. Professional? That means he makes his living at this, I guess, which is pretty amazing. But he'd like to know why I haven't done a run through of any Serlin games since they're so well designed. Puzzle Strike is like Dominion 2.0. Yeah, Puzzle Strike is also a player versus player take that game, as I understand it. Um, it's not Dominion. It's, it's Dominion 2.0 if Dominion was all about curses. Um, basically, I, I understand these games are very good, but as I understand, they are also very in-your-face. PvP. That's why we don't play Magic the Gathering anymore either. So that would answer your question, Sean. Good luck in your next tournament. Let's see here. Oh, I can see the end. Honey, it's, it's coming up. Oh, my goodness. But in the meantime, Anderson wants to know... Let's see. He recently saw my video for dogs and was wondering... How did we end up getting that game when it came? When it had such a low print run from Brazil? That is a good question. The reason I ended up doing that is because I had a fan in Brazil who really loved the game and sent me a copy. Um, Wasn't he also like a um, director or something like that where he chose that for No, 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 no. You're probably thinking of something else. I mean, that has happened. Uh, but no, no, this was a few years ago. Remember the dog game where yep. we drove around and, and yep. got the strays and took them back and nursed them back to hell and I all did. that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the only reason I had that is because there was a Brazilian fan of the game and he picked up a copy and he mailed it to me. And it must have cost him a small fortune to do it. And then he wasn't done. He went and actually personally translated the entire rules from uh, Spanish to English so that I could play it. That is why it happened. I'm pretty confident I gave him a shout out in the final thoughts because it wouldn't have happened without him. And, that, and if that's happened a few times um, over the years. It's really, really cool. It's really amazing. Um, to the earlier question of what do I prioritize, if somebody does that, well, that puts oh. it pretty high on my priority list because you know, that's, it's so amazing and above and beyond. In the same manner, do you have interest in off-market games like this? If yes, how often do you give your attention to these types of games? In all honesty, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, I mean, I don't, I, when, he, when he contacted me and said, hey, I'd love to do this, I said yes because we love dogs and I was interested in the gameplay. So, it's not about to me it's not about whether it's all, whether it's a big major production or whether it's some little indie game. It's about I read the rules and I decide whether I'm going to like it or not. So, yeah, I, that's what it comes down to for me. Hardest question. Just got Mombasa. Already more and more amazed by Alexander Fister, the designer. And yes, he's right. Uh, I also am impressed by Mr. Fister. Do you think he already has space in your top 10? I'd have to look at my top 10. Um, 
But I think, I think, yeah, I think he probably would be pushed. Actually, let's look. Let's just look really quick right now. I am going to go to. I'm going to do a Google search for Rado top ten designers. Let's look at that top ten list and see if I would push him out or push somebody out. Pause. We don't need the sound. Hey, everybody. Blah, blah, blah. Let's just look at the list. <laughs> and my number 10 on that list was Reiner Knizia. Number 9, Vita Lasarda. Number 8, Matt Leacock. Number 7, Javier George. Matthias Kramer, Uwe Rosenberg. Vaccarino, Michael Kiesling, Vlad Shavadl, and Stefan Feld, my number 1. Wow. Yes, he would. He would push in. So he would make my top 10 at this point. Um, after... After uh, Great Western Trail. Yeah, has to. That was not even a hard question. All righty. Scott wants to know, do you consider limited move games to be difficult, i.e. more strategic, an abundance of choice or a flaw in the design? I think your sentence was kind of broken there a little bit, Scott. But, okay. But I understand the question. Uh, honey pie. Mm. Games that really constrict us, that limit what we can do. Okay. He would like to know. Um, oh, because he's talking about Viceroy and Keyflower. Hey, there's an abundance of point scoring potential, but you're so greatly restricted by the limited number of moves, money, resources, makes it very hard to build or achieve anything. Yeah, no. Uh, particularly if you waste one or two turns, um, you know, wasting currency, you know, whatever it might be. Do you consider limited move games to be difficult and abundance of choice? Or again, that's all right, I shouldn't read that. Is that, is that uh, a flaw with the design? No, I think that is part of the design. I don't think it's mm-hmm. a flaw. I think it's a strength of the design. And honestly, I think... Oh, I'm sorry, you were going to say more, Honey Pie? I, I find them frustrating. You find them frustrating? Yep. So you define Agricola frustrating? Because Agricola is a game that puts you under extreme yeah. tight restrictions. Yeah, sometimes I do find it mm-hmm. frustrating. Because I like to get the stuff done that I want to get done. Yes. Okay. But I, w- I would say that we've played other games that are even more restrictive mm-hmm. than Agricola. And I, I know I've told you, and I'm frustrated by the fact that I can't get anything done. I mean, we've almost quit games sometimes because I'm like, yeah, I've just spent two turns doing nothing. I've been setting up. No, okay, that's a different thing. Okay. Um, yeah, we, I actually, I talked about that in the top 10 games that Jen and I disagree on. You're talking there about games that don't let you do a lot in a given turn. Yeah. Like discoveries. Games that, and you were, you were just, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, but you were just about to say games where you have to spend three or four turns before you get anything done. Yep. And that's what you don't like. Yeah. Game, you know, what I call baby step games. And I don't <laughs> understand why it hasn't caught on yet because it seems like a no brainer. Games where, yeah, you don't, you don't really get much done on your turn. But over the course of four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten turns, or heck, even the course of an entire game, you can achieve massive things. But it's piecemeal, it's just little tiny baby steps. And yes, you hate that. There have been several games we played like that, and you're just like, I am not having fun. I know. And I'm like, honey, if you just wait a few more turns, you'll, you'll get it all done. You're like, I don't want to wait. I want to do it now. Yes, that's exactly right. Fair enough. Me, I have no problem with that at all. But I don't think that's what he's talking about here. Okay. Um, because, I mean, for us, I mean, that's what, it, to me, it's the definition of, of, of a non-sandbox game. A game where you can just do whatever you want. And there's no restrictions, no limiters, no problems, no system in the game saying, well, you know what? I know you would really, this is what you'd like to do in a perfect world. This is what you want to do right now. Yeah. Daisy, it's okay. Um, but you can't do that right now because you rolled the dice and, and that was limited what you were restricted in. Daisy, come here, Daisy. It's okay. Good girl. Good girl, Daisy. Come here. Come on, Daisy. All right. Good girl, Daisy. Saved us. I don't know if you guys could hear that on the mic, but good girl, Daisy. All righty. Games where they don't really put those kind of restrictions on you, the less restrictions there are, the less fun I, the less interested I am in the game. I like games that say, you know, here, you know like uh, most recently, remember that game Ulm where there's like the grid and, you know, it was like a three by three grid and you, you take a tile, you slide it in and then another tile slides out. That's the tile you take for the future. Yes, but in the yes, meantime, yes. you yeah. do those three. Yes. And then that's a, that is a, a core mechanism that restricts you greatly. And you have to figure out how to make that work. And that's a puzzle. Yeah. I love that. I did too, actually. Um, you know, and so, and, but a lot of people hate that. A lot of people don't want to... Well, look, I just want to do what I want to do. And you know, I don't want to have some restriction of I don't have enough money to do it. Or it takes me... You know, I don't know. I mean, to me, 
a, um, you know, things that limit me, I think that's a strength of design because it forces me to solve a problem. And that's what I enjoy doing when I sit down to play a game. Okay. What are you looking around for, Honey Pie? I'm just wondering where your microphone is. My microphone is right here. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, so I don't think it's, it's a flaw in the design, if that's what you mean. But maybe you mean what Jen was talking about. You just don't like games where you don't get to do a lot on a given turn and it takes you many, many turns. Like Discoveries is the perfect example of that. Although there's been other games like that too. Although Discoveries was really the game where we learned. Because Jen said, I'm not having fun. And she didn't really want to articulate why. I'm like, honey, I have to talk about why we're not keeping this game. And Discoveries was really the one where we discovered (laughs) that Jen doesn't like baby step games. Okay. Mark wonders. um, He's pre-ordered Gloomhaven. But it's been canceled by his online retailer in the UK for supplier reasons. He totally understands. He was wondering whether we can recommend an alternative to Gloomhaven that will scratch that itch while we wait several years for the reprint. Dude, it's going to be on Kickstarter in a few months. You don't have to wait. Um, Actually, I believe it's going to be on Kickstarter in April. So just back it this time. I don't understand why people don't back games on Kickstarter. Why take the risk if it looks really awesome? But anyway, sorry. It's going to be on Kickstarter. So um, my answer to your question would be Gloomhaven. In the meantime, we love claustrophobia. Um, oh, it hasn't come out yet, but uh, oh, I did a run through for it right around the same time I did a run through for Gloomhaven. What was it? Oh, it was a very, very cool game. That you, I mean, it was a dungeon crawler, but it was driven by Rondell. It was a very, very cool game. Oh man, I can't think of the name now. Uh, Rado Rondell Dungeon Crawl. Doing a Google search. That'll hopefully find it. Uh, oh, that's right. Because oh, his name changed. That's what it was. Oh, Perdition's Mouth. Abysmal Rift. I don't think... Abyssal Rift. I don't <laughs> think that's out yet. But that's actually a really, really cool... It has... Some of the same kind of stuff. It has a campaign. But really, nothing can replace Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven is a one-of-a-kind game. One might even say it's revolutionary in its scope. And some of its gameplay, too. All righty. So, do you have anything else, Mark? Yeah. Just, yeah, my answer... Just... What? It's going to be on Kickstarter. Back it. Don't miss it. All righty. And last question for the non-personal stuff. Compared to the 80s and 90s, today's game feature more co-op. This is from Raphael. Do you think this is mostly a matter of design improvement, the industry making better products, or does it tell something about a shift in our society? Mm. Well, I would like to think that it uh, indicates a shift in our society. I'd like to think people are being more cooperative with each other. Do you say you'd like to think that because that's what you think, or you just... You'd like to think it because that's what, it puts that's a smile how, on your face. I hope that's the way our society is going. I would like that to be the case too, but I, I'm sorry, Raphael. I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, I don't think it's indicative of some kind of fundamental sea change in society as a whole. Um, if anything, well, people have said I shouldn't get so political in the podcast, so I won't go into that. But um, yeah, 2016 and 2017 look to be telling a different story than that. Um, stupid nationalism. Anywho, I'm a big globalist fan. Um, no, I think it's more a reflection of the fact that it's a new genre and it's an awesome style of game. And if you're going to make a game, ideally make one that's going to sell well and cooperative games are going to sell well, provided they're well done. And as more people play them, more people like them, more people want to make them. I just think it's a reflection of it's a cool new thing. It's a wonderful way to experience board gaming. It's uh, something that board gaming can do that pretty much no other form of entertainment can match. Really, when it boils right down to it. So I think you're just seeing more co-ops because they're awesome. Number two, do you see any difference between modern games and venerable classics such as Backgammon, Mahjong, Bridge, Poker? Um, are, are our games looking more toyish because we are more childish? In other words, would you see Clint Eastwood, Lee Van Cleef, or John Wayne playing Seven Wonders or Agricola at the, uh, at the OK Corral at the saloon? Hmm. Um, mm, let's see. So basically, well, no, that's interesting. I think that is a question that is about societal norms and societal shifts when it boils right down to it. Because while gaming has been with humanity since the beginning, um, I mean, you know, it's something that, you know, because we are a social animal, games have always been a social lubricant to grease the wheels. I mean, you know, in ancient times, the Olympics would bring warring city states together. Um, so they could put aside their differences and, and, and share in a camaraderie-based thing, even though there was still tribalism you know, at its heart of it. Uh, you know, I mean, gaming is... I mean, chess, Moncalas, they've been around forever. So, but I do think 
there is kind of a societal shift that's happening pretty much in this generation, in my generation, in Gen X generation. Because we're after, was it, baby boomers and Gen, Gen X, right? We're the children of the baby boomers. Because we grew up in a very interesting, fundamental sea change, which was video games. I was playing video games as a kid, and I pretty much played them my entire childhood into my adolescence and well into my adults. Um, I've only recently stopped playing them in my 40s. And that, I don't think, has ever happened. I think games have always been a childish exercise that as you grow up, you are supposed to put aside, except for the serious ones, specifically sports and chess and backgammon if you're in Greece and various places. But um, you know, games as a pastime, I think in pretty much all previous generations are a childish pastime you put aside. So no, I think games... Because we've had this fundamental sea change where my generation grew up playing video games because the previous generation didn't have them and never, ever stopped playing. It has Video games, for the first time, have made gaming a truly, uh, you know, something that adults do. You know, I mean, nothing, nothing has changed that more than mobile gaming, app-based gaming, that everybody plays. Everybody on their smartphone has a game they play. And so that has changed the attitude towards games. And board gaming is benefiting from that hugely. Um, people are saying, oh, it's okay to game. We, that's not something for children. So, yeah, the, uh, you know, the old venerable cowboys, they would have thought it was childish not because it is childish, but because that is a generation's old perspective. That finally, um, humanity has shifted, and I don't think it's going to shift back. As far as you know, when designing new games, what comes first? Mechanisms or theme? You know what? That's going to vary from designer to designer. Reiner Knizia, he comes up with mechanisms, and then as often as not, somebody else, the publisher, comes up with a theme and puts it on top. But plenty of designers, you know, they, you know, um, oh, who would it be? Vita Lasarda or uh, Ignacia Trebchek. I've talked to both of them. I know this is true for both of them. They say, I want to make a game about X. And then they research the subject matter. They find out what is the thing they're trying to simulate. And that leads them to discover gameplay mechanisms. Both ways work. Uh, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. There are as many ways to design games as there are designers designing games. Why do I prefer Dominion over trains? Doesn't the space element enhance the game enough, especially as trains cards are greatly inspired by Dominion? That's certainly true. And I have to admit, when we first played trains, we were really impressed by it. And at the time, I was super duper stoked about it. But as time went on, I think we kind of cooled on it for a couple of reasons. One, at the end of the day, neither Jen or I particularly care about trains. I mean, there are plenty of we have plenty of train games, but we don't seek out train games. We like uh, railways of the world or Isle of Trains, not because they're trains, because they're really cool games. I mean, we could take or leave trains, I think. So it's not like that was pulling us in. Um, and at the same time, the thing was, we were so committed and continue to be so committed to Dominion. Uh, I mean, pretty soon I'm going to be doing a run through of every single. I'm going to be doing my top 10 Dominion expansions because there are 10 expansions. I'm going to be doing a run through for Dominion. <laughs> so. I mean, we decided to commit to Dominion because we love it so much. It's a wonderful thematic exercise. I mean, you're, you're kind of implying the train is more thematic. I don't think that's the case at all. I think Dominion is very, very thematic. I talked about that in the very, very first episode of this podcast, if you want to go back and listen to why. So we were so committed, I didn't want to commit to another game that was going to be getting lots of expansions and whatnot. Particularly because, you're right, they're very, very similar. It's just it, t trains take Dominions and adds a board. That's really, really cool. Um, I mean, heck... If there were an expansion for Dominion that added the board, I would totally take that expansion. I would play with it every once in a while. But I already have Dominion, so I don't need a Dominion-like game, even if it does something really cool and different. So that's basically what it boils down to. Honey Pie, we've done it. Oh my goodness, I have it. no idea how long that took. But those were all the game-related questions. And now, folks, um, if you don't care about the personal stuff, I think we are going to bid you adieu. But we'll be back in just a few short weeks because this podcast is so late. Once again, I apologize profusely. But Jen was on the road and she finally got back as soon as we could. We got on the couch. <laughs> um, but uh, if you have any more questions, as always, send them to questions at raw.com. Otherwise, we'll be back in just a few short weeks and uh, pick up where we left off. But now, if you'd like to hear some personal questions... Well, you and can stick answers. around. And what, hey, Pi? And answers. And answers, yes, of course. It'd be so much easier if I just read the questions. Yep. Oh, here, somebody asked this. Yeah, that's <laughs> interesting. Okay, what's the next question? Okay. We'll be right back, folks. Hang on. Oh. 
Okay, folks. I think I'm just going to sit back and let Jen take this one. <laughs> Honey okay. Pie, are you ready for all these questions? Uh, sure. All right. Um, personal questions. Go. Itai. Never know how to say his name. But um, Itai, or, uh, Itai asks... You started your top 25 anticipated 2017's game video by saying, fingers crossed, this is going to be a good year. Can it get any worse than last year? Yes, but I'm not going to get into that today. So, can you please get into that? Why did you think 2016 was a bad year? <laughs> yeah, I don't um, And why do you fear 2017 may get worse? Would you like to, or do you just not want to even talk about that? I want you to talk about it. Well, I know some people don't like me getting all political, so I'll try to keep it short, but... 2016, with Brexit, with Donald Trump, with, as a, a small thing, um, the, uh, the bird referendum here in Malta, um, there's just, there was just this repeated pattern of, I want to say humanity as a whole, but that's not fair. Western society. Retreating. Western society regressing. After pretty much, you know, half a century of unfettered, nonstop, forward progressive movement. Granted, slow dribs and drabs, not near as fast as anybody wants, but still, on the whole, demonstrable progressive steps. Real progress uh, about mankind just getting better across the board. 2016 was a huge, huge step back. Um, with, you know, a resurgence of, of, of nationalism, of, of xenophobia, of us versus them, which is at the, the fundamental, I mean, that, that's the fundamental problem with human society, tribalism, us versus them. I mean, in spite of the fact that there are so many incredible, wonderful, heart-lifting, amazing stories, not the least of which is Germany. And, I mean, thank you, Germany. Thank you, uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel. I know you're not perfect. I know she could really be a lot better on gay rights issues. I realize that. But on the whole, you know, steadfast willingness to look their fellow man in the eye and say, you're hurting? Yes, we will help. Um, You know... So much of 2016, though, just spits in that face. And 2017 looks like it could be even worse. I mean, just in a few days, the Netherlands is going to vote. Um, and there's every likelihood. I mean, you know, I, a couple of years ago, I wouldn't have thought so. But after 2016, there's every likelihood that, oh, man, just the worst. Uh, I mean, I mean it's, uh, Amsterdam. I forget the guy's name. I've seen several um, stories about him, and they're regressive nationalists. Keep everybody out. Keep um, keep Amsterdam for the Dutch. If you're if you're not Dutch, you're not much. Uh, kind of thing. You know, the fact that Amsterdam, such a wonderful progressive society, could potentially vote this guy in because of fear of the other, because of anger over globalism and a changing world, when in fact, globalism is such an incredibly wonderful, powerful step forward for humanity as a whole, and it's an absolutely crucial, necessary step. Um, you know, the people who've been at the top forever resent it and hate it, because, hey, why are things slowing down for us? This isn't cool. Well, it's so that everybody else can catch up with us. It's so important. It's such an absolutely crucial step to universal basic income. It's the future. It, it's what we need to get to our, to our Starfleet society. That is the only ultimate goal that we can be going towards. But, I mean, you got that. You've got Marie Le Pen. I mean, God help us if, um, if Merkel gets replaced. Um, you know, because, ah. Uh, I mean, if, if the EU falls apart because of stupid, stupid, stupid England, if they could actually let that happen, if France follows suit, oh my gosh, these are huge. This is cataclysmic sea change stuff in the overall direction and a reversion to simple tribalism. Stay away. Us first. Us not meaning humanity, the human race, but us meaning we want you to suffer so that we can benefit. That's not what anybody thinks when they talk about their nationalists and tendencies, but that's what the end result is, and it's terrible, and it just drives me nuts. So that, is, that answers your question. Ah, do you have anything you'd like to add to that, honey pie? I think you've done it well. All right. Those are just our opinions. We could be wrong. Heck, maybe we're hopelessly naive and childish, but I do think that is the truth of the situation. In your top 25, you said you're interested in Unlocked because you had a bad experience with an escape room in Texas and wanted to see it. Uh, all right, all right. Could you elaborate on the experience with escape rooms? 
You know, I don't need to do that here because I actually did talk about it, not in my podcast, but um, right after I came back from Gen Con, I talked about my other ex- experiences in Gen Con, but I didn't talk about this. But I got on a podcast wrap up show with, I remember Joel Eddy was there. And I forget who else was there, but I remember Joel was there. And several, and everybody was talking about their experiences, and I got on, and I told the story. And quite frankly, the story sold now, I barely remember it. But I, it was fresh in my mind then. So if you want, you can go check that video out. I'll put a link to it in the show notes of this podcast. Can you tell us more about your vacation in France? I know it was quite a few years ago. But what cities um, or areas did you like or dislike the most? What French meals did you like or dislike? Oh. Aside from playing board games with Jen, he's talking about you know the, yeah. the pandemic trip. And it wasn't board games. It was pretty much just pandemic. What did you like in there? Also, do you think that someday you want to go back and visit that country? Yes. And yes. just so you know, if you ever come to Paris, I'm happy to welcome you in my home. Oh, that's If so a convertible sweet. couch in the living room is good enough. Oh, awesome. Um, it certainly is. Uh, I would say, well, that was, it was a long time ago, but basically what we did is we came over on the, um, ferry from Calais and then, um, just sort of drove along the Northern coast. Yeah. We were in a camper van. So we slept at, at campgrounds. Yep. Um, yep. And just sort of drove along the North coast. I think we got about, mm, well, we got down to Mont St. Michel. Oh, definitely. I don't know. I don't don't know if we went further South than that. Well, yes, we did. Let me, I'll just pull up Google. Jen's going to the Google maps. Who the map is. All righty. But we loved all the food that we had. French food is awesome. Um, and, yeah, we really enjoyed pretty much everywhere we were. Um, I think the only place that we definitely said we wanted to make sure we got to was um, Saint Michel. Hmm? Mont, Mont, Mont Saint Michel, yeah. Yeah. So, and other than that, we were yeah, just that kind, was of kind of the goal. open to whatever we yeah. saw. We when just we played got it by there. ear, which was very out of character for Jen. I know, I love She loved likes it. to super regiment plan every single. Square inch of travel every second, but that one, uh, why, why is it? Why did we play it by ear? Because that's that kind of my style. I left you in charge. <laughs> <laughs> and then when we got there, well, where are we going? I don't know. Let's just go this way. Yep. You're like, what? <laughs> ah! All just right, calm on. down, calm just down. Go. It'll be fine. <laughs> and it worked out okay. Yep. Um. Yeah. So Jen's still looking up the Google Maps. I'm just looking at the map. And Daisy is trying to attack me. Daisy, I'm filming a podcast. Her, you cannot... Daisy's weapons are her whiskers. Yeah, you cannot whisk me right now, Daisy. She likes to get her face right up in your face and then rub her whiskers. I'm going to have to deploy the shield, which means I put a pillow in front of my face. <laughs> and so she'll... Far, sorry, folks. Sorry if she's stepping on the microphone. Oh, yeah, you're getting whiskered, people. Yep. It's not everybody that, you know, gets to experience that. All right. You um, done, Daisy? Yeah. Have you gotten the map up, honey? Yeah, but she's still on you. Well, go ahead and talk about the map. Okay. Well, uh, so yeah. So we we went to Calais, and then I believe that we just took the A16 down um, to the A28. And we, actually, we did try and get off of the main roads. But um, France has this wonderful thing called Airs, A-I-R-E-S. And they're just basically kind of like in America where you have um, rest stops along the road. But Airs are much nicer in that they are actually meant to be stayed overnight at. And you don't actually have to pay anything. You just park, and there's toilets and showers and things, and it's a, it's a safe way to just have an overnight stop if you just are kind of in the middle of your trip. And so we really liked that, although we did stay at actual campgrounds as well. And, and they were also nice, too. We went in the off-season. I think it was, it was September or maybe October. Maybe, was it November? I'd have to look it up on our calendar. But it got cold towards the end. I think it must have been October. Um, because we actually cut the trip short a couple of days because it was too cold to sleep in the camper van. <laughs> and we didn't have a, it's, we don't have, um, a heater and a kitchen and all that. It's not that kind of a camper van. It's yeah. the kind that just has the lid that lifts up so you can sleep on the roof, basically. Um, uh, that's so we don't have a fancy one. We just have a, a thing that's usable for sleeping in. It's a Mazda Bongo, if anybody I, wants to look that up online. Bongo. It's a, it's very cute. Yeah. And they do, I mean, lots of people convert them so they have, you know, seating and they have a kitchen and stuff in there. But we just. And by the way, folks, Daisy has finally given up. She's walked away. Very apologies for any snuffling and stepping you heard throughout all that. Hopefully that didn't completely obliterate what Jen was saying. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, I think that we did actually go almost all the way along the north coast of France. I don't think we got quite all the way over to, um, you know, the, the east, westmost 
corner there. <laughs> Sorry, it is. It has been a long time, and it wasn't like we had a map or anything we had to actually get to. We just enjoyed whatever we saw. <sighs> well, honey pie. That was rather. Rambling. I think Daisy did not get any satisfaction since I put the shields up, so she could not wish for me. Oh. It sounds like. Oh no, nope. All right, so she stopped harassing Gert. <laughs> We've got both beagles now. They're not. Right. They're oh no! no now Gert's me. just going to knock the camera over. Are you prepared to catch it? Uh, um, no, I'm just trying to keep Gert from knocking the camera over. Oh, it's getting late in the day, folks. Uh, Beagles, they know it's walk o'clock. But this is a long one. we got to keep muscling through. So you have anything else to say about the Paris trip, honey pie? Uh, the France trip. We didn't actually make it to yes. Paris on that. We, no, that's right. We didn't We did all. a separate trip to Paris with my parents, actually, and had a nice long weekend. And that was amazing. That's where we discovered crepes. Crepes. Awesome crepes. So, um, no, and hopefully... We we definitely want to. I want to see more of France. I think France is um, a wonderful country. Have you ever talked about your uh, French house porn? <laughs> on the I don't, I don't think, think you have. So no, but I don't want everybody to know about that because then they'll. Well, go I buy just told the, everybody about it. Well, they're not going to type. You're, in you're French not going to explain that. Porn. People are just going to ask next month. What what did you mean by Jen's French house porn? <laughs> okay, well there are some real estate websites out there. I, probably they pop up if um, if you just type in French property. I'm not. I don't, I don't know what the name of them are. But anyway, and there's just loads of property out in the country um, in France that are, you know, nothing. It's out in the country. So there's there's no jobs available. So the property is super duper cheap. But for somebody like me who wants to have a little farm, a couple of acres, um, let my beagles run free kind of a thing, it would be perfect. It would be wonderful. So occasionally I just get on these um, real estate sites and just kind of drool over well, you do them enough that Google AdSense basically shoves pictures of that oh. to you on any website you go to. You're yeah. just completely inundated 24-7 yeah. by pictures of picturesque French cottages yep. in the countryside. Yep. Enticing you to come by for only 40 euro, 40,000 euros yeah. or whatever. Yeah, I mean, you can get quite a nice little spot for 40,000, 50,000 euros. Yep. Uh, but, you know, you have to be retired and because uh, there's, no, there's no actual jobs in yep. that vicinity. But... It looks fabulous. <laughs> so I wouldn't mind driving around France and seeing some more of the French areas so that if should, I, you know, have that kind of money sitting around someday and the inclination, I'd go, oh, yes, well, obviously that is the house in the area that we really liked. Um, so I could fantasize a bit more about buying it. <laughs> yeah. <All laughs> but right. the likelihood is we never would because we don't speak French. And There is that problem. Um, you know, we could live in the States. We could live in England where they do speak English, and that's a lot easier. It does help if you speak the language. Okie dokie. Brian would like to know, how do you deal with the negativity you sometimes get on Rado Runs Through? I read your comment on the Undead Viking thread about a random YouTube content, and I'm pretty sure I'd call it a day after that. Yeah, You don't want to know about the comment I'm talking about. Okay. Um, I don't know. You know, it's actually that one comment you're talking about, which... Some of the stuff on YouTube is so comically, ridiculously insane that it's just kind of, you just have to treat it as just this kind of weird aberrant thing and just kind of ignore it. It's hard because the folks who do that tend to be very, very aggressive. And it used to be, I would actually try to say, hey, could we just calm down and maybe talk about what makes you want to say that terrible, horrible thing? Um, and I would try to reach out to them and sometimes I'd have success, but a lot of times I wouldn't. And I have to admit, I've just kind of given up. And now when I see those, I just insta-ban. And the thing is, the weird thing is, they don't realize, it seems, that when they're insta-banned, that their posts will never show up on any of my videos. But the weird thing is, they'll still post anyway, and I still get mail notices. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my god, this guy. And so I ultimately, then I have to go into Outlook and start setting up rules. Okay, I didn't want to see this anywhere. So, yeah, I just you just have to kind of shut it down. But on some level, those things don't bother me as much as the more creeping, cynical negativity you get on board game geek and other places um you know just the the fundamental lack of trust and and human empathy that you see online it's just incredibly depressing sometimes and i just have to i don't know it's hard i, I don't really have a good answer for how i deal with it um it's it's been you know over the last few months particularly bad and i just kind of try and muscle through um let's see jason would like to know uh, da, da, da. Oh. oh, looks like this is a 2016. Oh, he misses my optimistic ways. Because, yeah, in spite of Trump and Brexit, 
2016 also has had the Cubs win the first World Series in 108 years. And um, Brian himself looks like he had um, his first child. Did I see that? I'm trying to skim this really quick. All right. Um, oh, yeah. And you notice uh, I've really been on a downturn for my positivity ever since Brexit. And uh, highly recommends I watch the Rubin Report. Actually, I'm sorry, Jason. I'm not a fan of the Rubin Report at all. I, uh, I, mean, I guess on the whole, he's okay. But his whole, what do you call it? The regressive left thing and his railing against political correctness just rubs me so the wrong way. Um, yeah, and you know, and his whole why I've stopped being a liberal thing he did a few months ago, that was just terrible. I just can't stand him. I'm sorry. I, I think... No, that's not fair. I was about to say he's what's wrong, and he's not what's wrong. He's just a, a minor symptom. Um, yeah, so I'm not a big fan of Ruben. I really like... Oh, uh, Sam Cedar, The Majority Report. I love Rachel Maddow. Uh, Kurt Eichenwald. There's a lot of really good ones, but uh, Ruben, not really a fan. Jimmy Dore is horrible. The Young Turks, I can take in minor. I, I, I can handle a little bit of them, but um, they get kind of off. Ah, anyway, so, um, but congratulations on your one week old. I, I, I think that's great that it was a good year for you. And I know it was a good year for a lot of people. And there were a lot of really good things that happened. And it looks like Daisy has finally tracked down Gertie. So, folks, we're going to have to put this on hold because it's going to be nonstop howling for the next <laughs> five or ten minutes. While they we'll, frap. While they frap. <laughs> stands for Frantic Random Activity Period. We'll be right back. Okie dokie. Now, hopefully to some less politically charged Q's and A's. Although, don't get me wrong, I'm always happy to talk about this stuff, but Jen isn't particularly. She just likes Gets to... depressed about it. Yeah. Just hope things will work out. Um, and I'm sure they will eventually. It's just people, eh. people got to stop blaming globalism for the what's happening due to automation. It's just, as a whole thing. Anyway, um, let's move on to Nate, who wonders, or who notices that I mentioned uh, at one point or another that my Rotto persona is fairly different from who I am or how I behave. Can I give an idea of how they differ? Honey Pie, can you give the nice folks an idea of how mm. I differ? You're a quiet, quiet man, mm. normally. Um, yeah, you you just have a work persona and you have a normal persona. And a normal persona is just like a normal person. I'm sure we're all a lot quieter and more relaxed when we're at home. And yeah, you're funny. You're very, very funny, <laughs> regardless of who, which... Which one you're doing, and uh, you're always a very considerate person. That's that's the reason I married you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I'm doing when I do a Rotto runs through, or this for that matter, is just kind of like a heightened and exaggerated version of myself. Yeah. Well, you're trying to make sure everybody has a good time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to be an entertainer. It's basically is funny when I was in high school. I was a really quiet, shy, withdrawn kid, always wore a hoodie, walked around all the time listening to Beatles on my Walkman <laughs> back in the 80s. Um, and yeah, uh, all of a sudden overnight I got propelled into the limelight because some upperclassmen thought I was funny uh, and ended up casting me in the play against uh, the, the big yearly senior play against my will, even though I was a junior. And then overnight suddenly everybody knew who I was because I was a big hit. And so I very quickly had to develop this, oh, I'm really a quiet, shy, withdrawn, introverted person. And that's how I rate. If you do the STIJ, whatever things, I always rate. Nothing like what you would think. <coughs> but um, yeah, and it's just, it's just a persona I was able to use. It's weird, too. Um, when I went to college, mm -hmm. I was already starting to try to... I was, I, was, I was reverting back to my quiet, introverted, sh shy self. And, you know, coming down because, hey, oh, I'm in college. Nobody knows that I'm the loud guy voted most talkative of my senior year class. I think I was most talkative. Or was I class clown? No, I was most talkative, not class clown. Jerry was class clown. But anyway, oh, I'm sure I was a runner-up for it. And, uh, you know, Jen just happened to meet me right at that inflection point when I was kind of reverting back to my normal self. But I was still in a, oh, hey, it's my first day in German class. Who's this girl sitting next to her? Well, I'll just start chatting to her. 
and just chatting, you know, just making, you know, and she's like, and she, and, you know, it's just kind of just <laughs> lucky timing yep. that, um, you know, if, if, uh, if it had been a few weeks off, I might not have said hello to you at all. I just would have sat quietly in the class and... I would never would have noticed you. Yep, yep. Crazy. Um, anyway, Daniel says, if you and Jen were, and and, uh, and Nick Meaningham of uh, Board Game Raw were hitmen or hit women, would you be John Wick from the first movie? Uh, um, Jen does not get that reference. Although, honey, um, John Wick was a very uh, popular surprise hit indie film about an assassin who uh, basically goes on a revenge. The whole movie is a revenge movie after they kill his beagle. <gasps> yes. I can understand the rage. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying you have to answer whether you would go on an assassin rage-fueled uh, uh, revenge trip if they killed a beagle, but it is Keanu Reeves. Do you have anything to say about Keanu Reeves as opposed to me? You want me to compare Keanu Reeves well, to you? Well, you've done... Uh, oh, wow. What? I don't Whoa. understand the question. You, back in the day, you always used to say that you like Keanu Reeves so much because um, physically he reminded you of me because we're both tall. We both have long, skinny faces. Yeah. And But apparently, bah, she's totally forgotten about I that, I don't folks. understand the question. Well, what just, is the you question? Used to tell, you used to tell everybody this. Back when Keanu was at the height of his popularity. Yeah. You go, oh, I married my own Keanu and stuff like that. So I thought you were just going to say that. But oh. apparently, we've been married too long now, folks. The magic <laughs> is gone. Uh, apparently, I no longer have the, the Keanu bump. <laughs> oh, oh my. I'm learning a lot well, in this podcast. Do you remember we saw Keanu in line that time at the airport? Yes. And he was very scruffy. I'm afraid he... He and incredibly him. acne scarred too. Yeah, he kind of knocked himself off my list. Ah, uh, all right. Well, there you go. That must be it. It's not me. It's Keanu. Okay. Um, Paul would like to know. Oh, uh, this is a question for Jen. Is this something wow. related to Keanu? This is uh, after the last uh, <laughs> rude awakening. This isn't going to be good. Hey, honey pie. Yeah. What are my top three worst habits? Oh wow! You are loud. <laughs> I don't think anybody can argue that with how me. quiet I am. You're still loud. <laughs> so I'm going to say that is probably your worst habit, that right there. Um, three, huh? Hmm. Should I leave the room? No, because you'll listen to this later. I would say um, possibly when you are asking questions... You don't necessarily stop to listen to the answers. Mm. Okay. That might be something. Um, and then third. Uh, you leave your toenails around. <laughs> That's just disgusting. <laughs> it is terrible, I know. <laughs> oh, He used to feed them to our first dog, Scuttle, who was a little loss of opso mutt. Yep. And she loved them. I don't know what kind of a calcium deficiency she had, but she would eat his toenails. Yeah, I don't actually clip my fingernail toenails. I just kind of peel them off. Oh. And I, I just do that while I'm watching you TV. It's them. a terrible habit, you I know. And I try to just kind of put them in a little pile. And then I try to remember to get rid of them. But sometimes they fall off or something Probably like that. Probably a dog tail wipes you know, them off. Yeah. But I came. But you're home. right. I used to be able to feed him to Scuttle. I used to be able to feed him to Dobby too, but she not as much yeah, as Scuttle. Well, Scuttle she loved lost her teeth, didn't she? Yeah, yeah. But I came home and there was a toenail on my arm. I am sorry. Totally, I had every intention. <laughs> Bad habit. God. It's a terrible habit. I'm sure you've grossed. I've lost probably 30 percent of my audience now based on that one. <laughs> And, it, I, and I know it's bad. It's just it's just a lifelong habit. Yeah, and I I am saying this, but you know, like once or twice a year, I come across a toenail. It's not like they're, yeah. they're, it's not like we're drowning in them. I'm I'm pretty good about covering up the evidence. Yeah. Yep. But yeah, it's uh, I mean I don't know. Like I, I'm also really habitual about snapping my knuckles and stuff like that. I know no, you that don't notice. Me. Every time I ever do it in a video by accident, because I try to remember not to, oh. but sometimes I do it and it just drives people insane. Mm. So, but this is the same kind of thing, and, and yeah, it's it is it is unfortunate. But um, yeah, I just need a little sack here so I can just put them in. Well, but anyway. Yeah. So, there you go, folks. Apparently, he needs a toenail yep, that's sack, a, you guys. Yeah, get to know me. <laughs> My goodness. Um, right. So, Eric wants to know, when do you guys plan on moving away oh. from Malta? Well, does no one want to know what you think are my three worst no. things? Um, what was it? Was it Paul? Paul doesn't give a damn about that. He just wants to know um, what my worst habits are. Oh. Apparently, um, you're perfect. Oh. So. 
All right. Well, that'll be next month. Somebody will write and go, okay. Man, fair. I hope not, because that's a tough question to answer. Yeah, right in front and yes, no, I know. And no yep. preparation at all. Yep. Okay. All right. So Eric wants to know, when do we plan on moving away from Malta? Oh, I am tempted quite frequently. I've just come back from the States, and I, uh, it was really nice to be in the States with my family. So I'm afraid the temptations are only going to get worse. So I don't know. I think we'll be here one more year anyway. That's what we always say, one more year. Well, you know, it's hard because, you know, your mom's health isn't great. So that's a big that's a big part of our decision-making right there. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Yeah. Walk us through a typical day in the life of Rado and Jennifer. Oh, dear. Actually, my sister just asked me that question, and I was like... Oh, really? Yeah, I'm like, well, I don't know. We, I get up usually an hour or two before you do. That's true. Um, you get up at like 6 or 6, uh, 6 It or depends seven. on the time of year. It's, it's, it's light-based, Yeah, yeah. usually. Mm-hmm. I don't get up in the dark. I get up when the sun comes up, Yeah. Um, usually. I'm not at the moment because I'm on jet lag time, but mm-hmm. uh, actually, what did I sleep? Like 17 hours... Something like that, last, yeah. Last night, I came home crazy. and just crazy. Anyway, um, so I get up a couple hours usually before you do because you stay up a couple hours later than I do. Yep. Um, and that actually works out okay because then he can watch his zombie shows <laughs> without uh, being afeared that I'm going to come in and startle him. Yes. <laughs> Which is loads of fun. That might be <laughs> one of the things you put on your top three annoying things. <laughs> oh, but it's so much fun. Uh, right. So then I, I always make breakfast. We have eggs. We have hens. So we've got fresh eggs um, every morning, usually with bacon or sausage because we're um, low carbers. And um, usually I'll sit down and try and catch up on some email or something like that uh, as I kind of start my morning. I really, what I should do is jump on the torch immediately because it, you can sometimes look up and it's noon and you're still making your way through Facebook which is awful. Jen have, does have a Facebook edition. I have a problem. And I sometimes I can go months without looking at it, and I and get so much stuff done. <laughs> but occasionally I get sucked in, and it's been really um, hard lately because of uh, the Sicilian strays, actually, because we adopted our second little dog from Sicily. And so there's a, a lot of... It's a really active group of people on Malta here who have adopted dogs. Mm. Oh, did you just hear that? That's Gert groaning <laughs> as she's settled down. Um so, yeah, that's that's what's keeping me on Facebook at this point mm. is all the Sicilian stray stuff. But anyway, um, so, yep, and usually I'll go and get on the torch for at least three to five hours uh, if it's not a game-playing day, sometimes six hours. And, you know, that, that pretty much takes up the day. Then I get off, take the dogs for a walk, and cook dinner. And then we usually sit down and have a, an hour or two of the telly. In the evening, and then I head toddle off and read for an hour or so before I go to bed. Okay. And for myself, I... Well, my schedule is really... Ba- Jen just mentioned that whole, whether it's a game day or a torch day. Because every day is a game day for me. Because if it's a torch day, that's going to be a day that I film two or three run-throughs. Yeah. And if it's not a day where she's going to spend seven hours on the torch, then I try to get her to spend seven hours at the table. Um which is hard. Yeah. Um, you know, we try to, I try to get her to play a game every day. Uh, but, and we used to, I don't know, the, the, the schedule has changed off and on over the years. I'd say these days we're kind of doing more where it will be, we'll play uh, maybe four hours at the table playing a couple of games or one game twice or what have you. And then the next day, okay, I'll, I'll film that game and maybe another game that I'd, we played earlier or what have you. Um, you know, sometimes I'll get two or three or four days like that in a row. Sometimes Jen will go, I mean, she's got a lot of work. Uh, you know, she'll, she'll go several days just torching nonstop. And that becomes a real problem for me because because I got no one else to play these games with. Yeah. We got to play before he can film. Exactly. So, but yeah, my day is either I am learning to how to play a game. I am playing a game or I am filming a game. It's some combination of those three things. Or chat or following up on or all the yeah or spending people... a good deal of time maintaining rotto runs through because i really try to ensure if anybody asks me a question anywhere i answer it which is takes a lot of work and answer you know and all that stuff so it's one of those four things is how i got my day up and then in the evening uh like i said jen said she watches a couple hours i watch four or five hours 
because mm. I'm a TV junkie, and then I go to sleep. I usually go to sleep around midnight or 1 in the morning. You go to bed around 10 or 11. Actually, usually 10-ish. Yeah, and uh, and then you, but you read in bed for like an hour or so. Yep. And that's it. There would be an average day. And Monday to weekday, weekend, doesn't really matter. Yep, and, you know, there's occasionally days that I have to go into town and do grocery shopping sure. or whatever, yeah. but... <clears throat> Okie doke. Who's next? Alex. Notice that in the December podcast, I mentioned that, uh, I just mentioned, I stay up watching shows and movies when Jen goes <laughs> to bed reading. How does that work out for your marriage? I'm just wondering, since a while back, I tried that with my wife, and it didn't work very well for us. Oh, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. I would assume he's just saying that, I mean, I... I I don't know. Well, okay, forget about him. Um, <laughs> how do you feel about the fact that I generally stay up a couple hours later than you? Well, I think it's fine. Mm -hmm. We've been married for 26 years. Yeah. Alex, ask again in 20-some years <laughs> how, how it works out. It's, yeah, I mean, I think what he's saying is it's more just that, oh, well, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know them at all. I don't know. Or, or he does have an 11-year-old son. So... It's, I don't know, I guess I could give some idea, but it's probably in his early to mid 30s, I'm going to assume, maybe. Sure. So, I mean, I don't there is there, was there any kind of, do you cry yourself to sleep every night knowing I'm not there or going to sleep at the same time as you? No. Is that a problem? No. Um, do you, could you see how it would be a problem for some married couples? And could you articulate why it wouldn't be for us? <clears throat> I mean, it's funny. I have <clears throat> tried in the past to say, oh, okay, I, I won't stay up and watch TV. I'll just bring the laptop into the bed. No, that's and, so distracting. And that just doesn't work because Jen, she's out like a light by 11 or 11.30, and I'm still watching TV shows, so the screen's too bright and all that. So, yeah. I mean, I did try that for a while. And even though he's wearing headphones, you can still hear noise and stuff coming out of headphones. So, yeah. yeah, that's actually worse, I think. <laughs> Get out. Get out. You're making too much noise, and flickering is going on over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't think it's a problem. I we have plenty of together time, so I don't feel like I'm just because you're not in bed with me every second I'm in bed. Yeah. It's fine. Yep. Okay. Let's see here. Next up, we have Fabian again. Hey, Honey Pie. Oh, this is for you, it sounds like. Or maybe not. So he says, hello to Jen as well. No, okay, so this is for both of us. I just saw the Jen. I thought these were for you. Um, what's on the grocery list? Oh, um, I like cream. Cream is something that I have to make sure I'm constantly in supply of. Cause whole cream. I, whole Yeah, you know, uh, for tea, mm -hmm. mainly. Um, butter, of course. I like salted butter, Kerrygold. It's lovely. Uh, they apparently take good care of their cows. I like that. Pasture, pasture you know, fed cows. Um, yeah, we eat... Actually, we eat a lot of pork these days and some chicken. Not a lot of beef. Some lamb. No turkey, really, since we moved to Malta. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we get a bit of meat, but not a tremendous amount. We actually get most of our protein from the eggs we eat every day. Um, vegetables, definitely. How vegetables. many eggs do we eat every day? Uh, between six each and three each, just depending on if I cook eggs for dinner as well as for breakfast. But we usually have three eggs each mm -hmm. at breakfast time. And uh, let's see. So vegetables, I tend to buy frozen vegetables because there's a great store in Malta called Miracle Foods. That has nice big bags of freshly frozen veg. And I read a long time ago that that's actually probably the best way to get your veg because they freeze it at its peak from the fields rather than, you know, picking it slightly under ripe and letting it ripen on the way to the grocery store. And then it sits around in the grocery store for days to a week before you get a hold of it. And then it, you know, you may not get to use it for a couple days or a week. And so, ah. I just mostly buy frozen veg. So we buy lots of cauliflower, definitely mixed bell peppers. Those are my favorite. Um, they're low carb. Spinach, onions, um, mixed veg, you know, like some carrots and peas and broccoli and cauliflower. Um, I love the Mediterranean mixes that have eggplant and zucchini in it and tomatoes. The husband is not exceptionally happy to eat tomatoes, so I try and hide them in things. <laughs> Because uh, they're really good. Did you know that uh, actually men should have a cooked tomato dish twice a week for prostate health? Not raw tomatoes, cooked tomatoes. So spaghetti sauce or um, tomato soupy stuff, what have you. Um, so there's, I guess that covers the majority of what we want. Oh, I love coconut oil. I cook a lot with coconut oil. Uh, let's see. 
some spices. There's, there's these wonderful like Thai spice that you can get in a jar and you can just mix a little bit of that in with your stuff and it tastes fantastic. Uh, and then occasionally we'll go for something nice like ice cream, but try not to have that too much. Or some Maltese bread. Oh my gosh. If you come to Malta, there's a, they have this kind of bread called Habsa and it's basically kind of a sourdoughy kind of bread, but not quite as sour as sourdough, but it is absolutely delicious. It's perfect, kind of crusty, but soft inside, tastes delicious. Oh, a little bit of salted butter on that. Yep. Yum. And then our, our big treat, I guess, that we allow ourselves is I always buy dark chocolate. There's a specific kind that I like, um, which we can now get on Malta because Waitrose, which is a British supermarket, um, has an outlet here on Gozo, actually. So um, they bring in this wonderful dark continental dark chocolate and so i can live here now <laughs> i used to have people bring it for you know from england to yep. me but i mean that stuff is just the best and so i'll oftentimes if we're gonna have a dessert i'll make chocolate mousse with this dark chocolate and cream and an egg and that's basically it and it is absolutely what is it honey the mousse the mousse Do you have it's any? excellent okay what I don't I'm just I'm just saying I think it's awesome, but I oh was... yeah, it's, it's incredible. Okay. It's fantastic. Yep. Or we do baked apples oftentimes with coconut um, shredded coconut instead of uh, you know like oatmeal-y stuff on for that. Love baked apples. Mm -hmm. So try and have some fruit and veg. Yeah, I guess that's pretty much it. Well, the biggest thing is I mean obviously we don't do pasta, we don't do bread usually because we low carb mm -hmm. everything, um, and really a big part of it is you just use those frozen vegetables that you heat up in lieu of pasta yep. or whatever. It's all about, you know, using that as a base and then doing all kinds of meaty type, saucy type stuff, putting on top of it. On top of it. Yeah. Or stir frying it all together. Yeah. yeah. I do that quite often because I'm a one pan cook kind of gal. <laughs> Nothing fancy, but it sure tastes good. At least to us, it does. Yum, yum. And crock pot. I love cooking with a crock pot. Mm. Just throw all that stuff in there and come back in eight hours. <laughs> Uh-oh. That's Daisy. Oh, Daisy wants to warn us of something else. All righty. Do you speak any programming languages? Which ones are your favorite? No. I can't imagine you do. Uh, let's see. <laughs> I got line 10. Go to <laughs> line 1. That's about all I've got for programming. You missed the print hello world <laughs> or print gen. Uh, my programming experience, I started out on my Texas Instruments 994A learning basic and then extended basic. Mm -hmm. And then at the ripe old age of 12, I jumped directly to assembly or on, on that TI. And then in high school, I forget what it was. There was some proprietary thing that he um, had us learn on Apple IIs. Can't remember for life me what it was called. When I went to college, I took an ADA course and a Fortran course and one other before I eventually said, you know, because I originally my my original intent was to you know do computer uh, engineering, computer programming computer sciences, but the University of Washington had really super tough high-level math requirements. And I just said, ah, man, I want to do this programming and I'm enjoying it, but I just can't be bothered to do all this advanced calculus crap that isn't necessary. I don't need it. So I switched majors and basically went into scientific and technical communication. Um, of all of those, I don't know, every time I sit down in front of a keyboard now, I'm still transported back to being an 11, 12-year-old typing in, um, you know, call, clear, Call you know all those old um, uh, extended basic commands from all the games that I would program for myself on the old uh, to 994A. Good times. Let's oh, see. Oh, and he's not afraid to get into DOS. If, if ever we have a <laughs> DOS thing, I'm like, ah, I run screaming and I I leave leave the house because <laughs> I don't want to get into DOS. All right. Have we watched Westworld? I have. Jen has not. <clears throat> um, West Wing. Westworld. West Wing. <laughs> yes, West, West Wing is Jen's favorite. <laughs> Westworld, um, Jen did not watch it because, I don't know, it's just too grim. Jen doesn't want to watch grim shows when it boils right down to it. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure she would really like a lot of the philosophical stuff and the, you know, the, you know, the speculative science fiction-y stuff, but it's just, it's just a grim, harsh show with, with terrible things happening to people who really aren't that great. So, yeah, it was just not for her, but I really enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, if so, how did you like it? And did you figure out some things beforehand? You know, I hate figuring stuff out beforehand. I actually make a concerted effort not to try to stay three steps ahead of the narrative and spot all the clues because I like being taken for the ride. But yeah, it was impossible to avoid everything about Westworld. So yes, I did know, uh, you know, all the, the Williams stuff 
And I'd hoped, actually, I'd, please don't let it be this. I don't want it to be spoiled. I want to be surprised. But nope, that's what it was. And, oh, spoilers there. Sorry, folks. Um, all the William stuff, if, if that means anything to you. Spoilers. So, yeah. Uh, I wish I hadn't because it made the whole thing anticlimactic. It would have been such a really great... I mean, you know, it's, it's clear they... Well, it's a shame. But yeah, I, I liked it. Hey, Honey Pie, since Malta's import taxes are quite pricey, have we ever thought about using Board Game Geek members who've traveled to Malta for vacation <laughs> uh, as a delivery service for some of our games? Oh. Well, Jen certainly thought about it for delivery of Stroop Waffle and uh, <laughs> various other sundries that we cannot get on this island. Yep. And I've just come back from the States loaded down with goodies. Yep, yep. Um, uh, like I said earlier in this very podcast, I have enough games. And people send me review copies of games. And, you know, once or twice a year I do a really big order from games. Uh, if you There's no import taxes if you get stuff from within the EU. It's only if you get them from the U.S. or Asia or something like that. So I just order stuff from inside the EU. Shipping is still really bad, which is why I only do a few times a year and try to coordinate with other people on Malta so we can spread the shipping burden around. What are the unpacking strategies? Rip up frantically, carefully take your time. Un- unpacking? Yes. Strategy? Unpacking strategies. Oh, you mean when we get a new game? I guess, yeah. Boo. I don't know. I guess we try and get, N- if we're neither? like at Karthix, we try and get rid of the heavy stuff. What do you mean? We punch so that we're not carrying a bunch of extra Oh, you mean we come back from, yeah. Well, we definitely at Essen... Do a bunch of. Uh, I think we got rid of like eight or nine kilos, kilos or something worth like that. of cardboard yeah. before. But no, normally I just pull a a, a, knife, a, a steak knife out of the <laughs> silverware drawer and just cut into it and open it up in a calm fashion, I suppose. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, what movie never fails to crack you up? That's tough. I don't know. Oh. Actually, I don't really laugh that much. I mean, I, I find things funny, but I don't... Never fails to crack you up. Or you. And, and I... Yeah, it's fine. I'm just trying to think. Um, we don't... Well, first of all, you don't watch movies again. Very rarely. Yeah, we used to all the time. But, yeah, not anymore. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we we watch less and less movies all the time. In all honesty, yeah, we've got. I mean, we'll we'll go months without watching a movie because TV is at this point so much better than movies. Just well, a, it is. It just for is. me, TV is easier because they're in hour segments rather than two hour segments. And yeah. Oftentimes, I'm a little tired, so I think, oh, I'll just watch a show. But then, by the time the show's over, I'm like, oh, I gotta watch another. Yep, Jen is a terrible binge watcher. Yep. she's uh, obsessive. I mean, yeah, she'll happily spend five hours watching a show, but she can't make it through a ninety minute movie. Well, I can it's just it's the commitment of watching the movie as opposed to watching um, the show uh i don't know maybe ace ventura that's what i was thinking yeah you were thinking the same thing yeah yeah i don't know that we haven't seen it in so long i don't know that we would laugh but yes yeah, thing i mean but that's i mean i i, I enjoy it i think it's funny but it's i don't know i mean joe versus volcano is hilarious but i don't laugh out loud at it yeah i don't know yeah i was trying to think i mean it's not like the potter flicks are ha 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 funny yeah those are ones I've you have stumped us. We do not know. Apparently, no movie never fails to crack us up. Uh, right. So, Dave says, "What's the medical care situation like in Malta?" I mentioned in the past, it's sometimes frustrating going shopping because stores aren't always marked and keep regular hours. Mm. Is the same true for pharmacies, doctors, and the like? Are the costs as cheap as the other living costs you've mentioned before? Um. So there's a free healthcare clinic in the middle of Gozo um, that everybody can go to, and it keeps normal hours. Uh, if you go in the morning, it tends to be very, very busy, so you'll sit around waiting for a long time, meaning an hour or two, to see the doctor. But we figured this out, and we go in the afternoon when there's nobody there, and you get in almost instantly to see the doctor. Um, so that's fine. We actually have had a doctor come to the house, do a house call. Yeah, that's the was awesome, awesome thing. Awesome. Uh, yeah, we found out from one of our neighbors. Who's a pharmacist. Uh, yeah, who's a pharmacist. And she, I mean, she doesn't go to the hospital. She just, it's ridiculous. I mean, what was it? It was like, it, it, was it was like 20 euros? I think it was 20 euros. 20 for euros call. for a house call. And we've had him come out a few times and he's great. Yep. I mean, I, I never really felt like um, I was missing out. No, but it was for stuff like we were so sick. With, it was A couple of years ago, we just couldn't kick a cold. It was like we were both sick as dogs for about six months, I yeah. think. Maybe it was just me. But anyway, um, yeah, so he came out a couple of times, listened to our lungs, prescribed some more antibiotics or whatever. 
Yeah, it was just awesome. And he, I mean, we'd call him. He'd come out that day. Yeah. And for like 20 euros. Yep. And would, would check us both over. It's a phenomenal. I mean, you never hear of people doing house calls anymore. But, and, you know, I mean, he's awesome. Yep. So that is definitely, I mean, it's sometimes easier to just go into the free health clinic because you're already in town or whatever. But, and of course, I, I don't know if he, if, uh, his name's Teddy, would do like blood draws or whatever. But if we had some serious something like my dad has to have yeah, his, question, his blood know. tested for INR and stuff like that. I don't know if that would work. But, yeah. um, Maybe you have to go to the hospital for that. Anyway, I don't know. But um, I've also gone to the hospital Yeah, you've for... had some bad experiences going to the hospital. Well, yeah. Just normal female stuff where you have to get stuff, you know, check pap smears and stuff like that. And yeah. um, I think actually part of it was a little bit of cultural misunderstanding because the lady swears she, she said my name. I spent a couple hours waiting in the waiting room when I had an appointment like at nine. Yeah, and you were there and people just kept coming in, sitting down and then going in and yeah. you just kept waiting and waiting. Waiting, yeah. waiting. And finally when I did be a little bit forward and go talk to one of the nurses and say, listen, I've been here since nine. My appointment was at, you know, nine fifteen or whatever. And it's, it's almost now, noon now. It's almost yeah. noon. Am I going to get seen soon? And she's like, oh yeah, we've seen all of the 11, the 1130 people already and everything. I'm like, well, I've been here. And she goes, well, we called your name. So maybe I just didn't, they didn't pronounce it in a way that I recognized. Jennifer I, is how Maltese pronounced Jennifer. Yeah. Jennifer. Or Mrs. Haim. Or I don't know what. I don't know what it was. But I didn't hear it. So, you know, is that my fault? Yeah, that's probably my fault. Hmm. But on the other hand, once I'd asked... You were not so gracious about it at the time. (laughs) I was gracious to them. I wasn't very happy when I got home. (laughs) Um, But anyway, so, you know, the next time I was there, I just made sure, you know, if they don't call me within a half an hour, I just ask one of the nurses and they go, oh, yes, well, you're next or whatever. Hmm. So anyway, that's all fine. Um, and again, totally free. We don't pay anything at all for medical care. Um, oh, actually, I, I, there are, like, you have to buy your own drugs. So mm-hmm. I buy my antihistamines and stuff. So Yeah, but everything's cheap. Yeah. Um, does that answer all the questions? I think so. That's a pretty oh, good answer. And we haven't been to a dentist since we've lived here. No, but... I went once. That was actually interesting. Um, when I was still working, um, I went to a dentist. But it was an NHS, or not an NHS, but whatever, the Maltese equivalent. It was a, it yeah. was a free you know, public insurance, but getting into dentist can be tough. No, actually, wait, no, I'm, I'm mixing up with England. It's hard to get a, no, I did. I did go because I had I really think sharp. Had, I think you had private dental. Yeah. I think it was, a, it was, it was a private dentist here through work. Cause you were, you're working at the time. Remember? Well, Cause, um, I was, yeah. The, okay. So the, I don't know. Peter had said something. All about I know it. is I got in, we yeah. didn't have to pay anything. Maybe I, cause it was, I was still working. It was a private dental thing through work or something. But the funny thing was, I mean, I had some really just sharp, <laughs> oh, yeah. sharp pain. It had been really driving me nuts for a while. And I was like, okay, this isn't passing. I'll just deal with it. I'll, I'll go in. And the guy, you know, opened up. He took a look and he said, um, yes, these are very, very high quality. You know, my, not my dentures. What do you call it? My fillings. Your fillings. Uh, these are very, very high quality. Uh, I would suggest you you live with it because I would not be able to do as high quality as what you already have, or words to that effect. Yeah. It's like whoa, whoa. Okay, well, I guess I'll just live with it then. And eventually, it did kind of go away. But uh, yeah, that was that was quite surprising. That was really eye opening. Yeah, and that was the guy that Peter said was fantastic. And yeah, and yeah, yeah. My boss, who had actually tried several places because he had real, and and he said, yeah, this guy's really good. He'll take care of you. And that was the response I got. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, well, that was surprising. Well, there's a dentist that's above the pharmacy in town, mm-hmm. and I got our, his card. I think we should go and have our. Yeah, we like so. Other than it's that, it's been five years probably since we've had our. Yeah. So we'll let you know how that is. If anybody cares, you can yeah. ask. <laughs> uh, next up, Jeff wants to know what is the beer situation in Malta? Any famous oh. breweries or craft beers? If I so, can... have you toured them? It's starting to get pretty popular here. Do you guys drink beer or prefer any alcoholic beverages while you game, or do you like to stay focused? Ooh. Okay, well, first of all, no, we don't drink beer. Neither of us care for the taste. But there is a national beer called Chisk. It's Which is spelled C-I-S-K. Yep. So, but it's pronounced Chisk. Mm-hmm. So, um, and yeah, apparently it's okay. I mean, uh, my dad drank it when he was here. He likes beer. Um, I don't know if they've got a brewery tour or something like that. It'd probably be something pretty easy to yeah, but Google. We're the wrong people to ask. We have no yeah. idea. There are also wineries and stuff here. You can do winery tours and stuff. But again, we're not we're not winers. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, we, well, we don't. I don't drink at all. No, duck I, drinks water. I my dad gave me a beer when I was like seven or eight. I thought it was disgusting, and I haven't drunk anything since. Yep. Um, I like sweet, froofy things. Yeah. 
So I'll have a mixed drink or something that's sweet and fruity yeah. if we're out or something. But or like you like Bailey's and cream or something like oh, that. Oh yeah, Bailey's is lovely. Yeah. But yeah, we don't drink very much. No, very. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I don't he drink, drink at, all, at all. Jen drinks a bit. Yeah, he drinks water. He doesn't even drink pop or fruit juice or yeah. coffee or anything. He doesn't drink tea. Nothing. Water. Just water. Still water. Or uh, milkshakes, but only when I'm in America. Because uh, you can't get a good milkshake over here anywhere in Europe. Yep. just can't be done. I've it's tried impossible. so many times. Okie doke. Uh, let's see. Living on an island, are there a- many big scary storms? <clears throat> Moved down to South Florida from the mountains last year and am not a fan of the big scary storms. Ooh, I love the big scary storms. We love big scary storms. Yeah. And I mean, there's not a lot, but we get a decent amount, I suppose. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you've probably seen recently in the news, Gozo had a natural stone arch, um, and it fell into the sea at the, during the last big storm. Yeah. What, last week? Was it last week? Yeah. Yeah. So, yep, big big storms, but we love it because the water is so beautiful. We look right out of our window at the sea, and so we can really enjoy those Yeah, waves. and, you know, we're, we're looking out at the sea, so we get really good lightning shows. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. We absolutely love it. We love inclement weather. Yep. Um, it's better than calm weather as far as we're concerned. Yeah, because yeah, the inclement weather <laughs> keeps the tourists away. <laughs> well, I just I just really like the movement of the sea and the colors in the in the water while it's moving and stuff. Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay. Uh G- Griffin wants to know what are our college experiences like? He's about to transfer to a four year university, starting to feel that first day of school anxiety. Any tips for college noobs? What games should he bring along to bring students into the hobby? Perhaps code names, maybe Agricola. Ha! <laughs> um, that's what Griff says. Well, it's been a long time since we were in school. Yeah. Um, Jen, you you finished your freshman year. Yeah, I did. I think some of my sophomore year as well. Did you? I thought you bailed and didn't do anything. I, I no, thought I, you finished no. your freshman and I kept going and I almost I finished about half my sophomore year where you didn't even go into your sophomore year at all. No, I did a little bit. I remember we started together our second year. Yeah, but you just I, maybe you I only quit made it very quickly quarter. and just went working full time. Yeah, and I I kept going at least one semester longer than you before I eventually just started I was working full time. a poor full-time. example. So we're we're terrible to ask. Yeah, we're we're both college dropouts. Yeah, and uh, I mean I don't know. Did you like college life? I didn't like it at all. Well, you actually lived a more traditional college life. Yeah, you I lived was, on the dorms. Yeah, I lived in a dorm. You lived with your mom. I lived with my mom about ten miles north of of yeah. the university, um, and just scootered in. Yeah, but I didn't like being in the dorm because, like I said, as mentioned earlier, I was actually very quiet and shy, and I just stayed in my dorm room all the time. Didn't really make any friends. Didn't particularly like it. It was loud and obnoxious. That's when I, that was at the time of my life when I had to start sleeping with earplugs, mm. and I still do to this day <laughs> for various reasons. Oh. Um, none, none, which include my snoring. Right? Oh, none at all. None at all. None okay. at all. Is that going to be one of the things you, the top three? No, that's a good one. That's a, that's a good one. Yeah, Jen's, Jen saws quite the logs <laughs> because of her deviated septum. Hmm. And yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we did. We just didn't get into it. Nope. I honestly, I, I mean, I didn't have any scholarships or any grants or anything, so I was having to pay for everything. My parents didn't pay for any of it, so I just kind of resented it. Um, you know, because I'm paying a lot of money here, and I'm not particularly enjoying this. And you know, I wanted to be a programming major, and I I could have, but I didn't want to have to do all the math. So I was doing a major that I was okay at. I could do it but i didn't particularly enjoy it i mean I, I i don't know and that was even back when tuition was somewhat affordable i can't imagine kids today paying i mean my friend um fo just told me it's thirteen thousand a semester for his son to be going Jeez to louise and i'm like yeah how much was it when we went i think it was maybe three or three thousand a quarter or something like yeah, that yeah. but um the way that's my parents was, worked it say, is yeah. My parents were divorced, so um, the agreement from when I was a child was actually, um, if you want to go to college, that's great. We'll pay a third. I mean, mom will pay a third, dad will pay a third, and I will pay a third. So from the very get-go, I was always putting half of whatever I earned into my college account, um, you know, from my very first jobs, babysitting and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had I had money to pay for my third of the tuition. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, so and obviously two thirds was taken, and I did get I did get a couple scholarships and stuff, so that helped a lot that first year, and maybe that was also why I chose not to continue is because I didn't get scholarships my second year. I don't know if you can apply. I don't remember. Yeah, but, it's all a blur now. Um, yeah, I mean, it was pretty clear to me that I needed to get normal life skills that were usable rather than I was taking a lot of art classes because I was going to be a graphic communicator. 
<laughs> and um, I actually just learned Macintosh on my own because the guy who owned the store had a, had one of the first Macintoshes. Or I don't know if the first Macintosh, no, no. but uh, one of the first versions of Macintosh. Yeah. And he had freehand and f- Photoshop, I think it was, on those. And I just sat down and learned them. And then we started a business together and had a graphic design business going as well as working for him in his jewelry store. And I got practical experience that way, which I think was a heck of a lot more valuable than So you're telling everybody schooling. don't go to college? I think having a practical skill is really... My friend Effa, who I just was visiting in Los uh, Angeles, Los Angeles um, said that there's a huge need for people like HVAC, um, people who can do that skill. It pays really well. It's like 20 bucks an hour or something. And the more, you know, courses that you've gone on for other HVAC stuff, you know, you, after you finish that course, your salary goes up a buck an hour. And after you finish the next one, um, it's like heating and cooling stuff, air conditioning and heating systems. Hmm. Um, and they're just desperate. They're absolutely desperate for people to do that kind of stuff. Um, but they can't seem to interest the kids these Hmm. days into doing it. And he's trying to do, he, um, you know, is in this neighborhood, thing with community churches and stuff, trying to get the the youngsters, meaning 16, 17, 18 year olds, interested in doing skill-based stuff instead of just going straight to college because it's so bloody expensive. The tuition is just crazy, crazy expensive where you can actually, you know, go to these HVAC courses or whatever. And it doesn't guarantee you any kind of competitive advantage in the workforce. No, I mean, I'd rather go go to something, have a usable, marketable skill, get out there, start making a reasonable living, and then... You know, once I've got some money in the bank, then you can do what you want. Well, that's what we've done, huh? We've we've, that's what we we've did. made ourselves okay. Yep. So yeah, sorry, we can't so really box. help you with the uh, first day of college, other than to say, be sure to take useful classes. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, let's see, Scott, last one, honey pie. Oh, good. We're almost done. I I've got dinner warming up. Yes, so I, I can smell it. It smells yeah. delicious. Okay. Alrighty, so Scott's partner is an occupational therapist who works with sensory processing, and based on that, he suspects, so I've said in the past, that I may have auditory modulation disorder. Oh, what the heck is that? Also known as central auditory processing disorder. It's an umbrella term for a variety of disorders that affect the way the brain processes auditory information. Uh, and, uh, you know, actually, Scott is just giving me some heads up as something, and Scott, I believe you're right. In fact, I don't believe you're the first person to tell me that. I think when I've actually had my hearing tested in the past, um, I don't, I don't know if that was the term, but that's what I was basically told. I have no idea what it is. Well, I guess I'll Google it later. My, I can't when we're when we're in a crowded room and there's a lot of oh. cast talk. I can't understand what anybody says. Oh, that. And unless they literally shout in my ear, I, it's just it's just everything blurs into a sea of just general kind of. White noise, yeah. human talk sound. <laughs> and I just can't. But my hearing is, is, it's not great. But, I mean, every time I've ever had it tested, it's good. Yeah. I have decent hearing. But I just can't make stuff out. And he's pointing out that this is likely what you have. And I believe you are correct, Scott. Uh, Scott, also, honey, this is our last question of the night. Because it is now 641 in the PM. Honey, uh, what was our loss of Opso like? Oh, she was awesome. Mm-hmm. She was our first pup. We got her as a pup. In fact, we got her, went, you know, newspaper, went over to somebody's house um, and selected her. I can remember. The- Back when people would put ads in the newspaper saying, free puppies. I but think they we, weren't free. I think we paid $20. $20. For $20 Something puppies like yeah. in the classifieds of the Seattle Times. Yep. It was shortly after we'd moved into our house. First house we ever bought in Seattle. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, we went over there and selected her and brought her home. And she was just this little ball of black fuzz. She was awesome. I don't have, did I go? I don't have of any recollection of being yes. at the selection process. Yes. I remember getting her back. No. And her crawling around and going under the... No, you drove. Remember we had that big red robe and I had her all bundled up in my uh, arms. Oh, I kind of remember that. And yeah, you were driving. I, okay. Yeah. That kind of sounds familiar. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so we had this big red robe that was, you know, a robe that I had discarded or whatever. She would clamp onto that with her little teeth and we'd kind of like swoosh her around on the floor like, uh, I don't know, we'd swiff her these days. But, mm. oh, she was so cute. And so we'd kind of like mop the floor with her. Um, <laughs> but she had the best time with it. She loved that robe. She, like It was like her Superman cape that she just hung onto with her teeth. She yeah. loved it. Uh, yeah, she was great. Her name was Scuttle. Scuttle. Named after the seagull from The Little Mermaid. Yep. Because she was black, too. So mm-hmm. kind of a cool scuttle. Just as a aside, 
It was definitely Whoa, after the... Whoa, I had no idea. You just blown my mind. Well, it was, it was mainly after the seagull in Little Mermaid. Yeah, okay. Um, but she was really good. She had an underbite, so for years we used to give each other the scuttle look with kind of sticking our lower jaw out yeah. at each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and she had a great personality. She was a submissive peer, <laughs> which was a real challenge to overcome, but we finally got her trained out of that. Um and unfortunately, when she was about eight, she developed something called Cushing's disease, which is an endocrine disorder. Um, I guess it either, it's usually in the pituitary gland, but there's uh, somewhere in the adrenal gland as well it could be. So depending on which kind you have, they can medicate it or not. And she had the kind you could medicate. So we had her on pills, the, the Cushing's pills, mm-hmm. which was prednisone and I can't remember, something else, uh, for a few years. So we got a few extra years with her. And that was really nice. Uh, she did move to Bend, Oregon with us. And then she moved to Austin, Texas with us. And we had her there. Um, and so actually she met Dobby. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dob got to live with her for a couple of years. Yeah. Well, and she then, taught Dob everything she knew. Yep. And uh, as a Lhasa Apso, they're palace guard dogs. Or they were originally bred to be palace guard dogs. So Scuttle was just primarily interested in being with us. She wasn't interested in what was going on in the neighborhood or running away or chasing stuff, you know, like rabbits or what have you. Um, so, but she did love to chase a ball. So she taught Dobby, our beagle, how to chase a, and fetch a ball, which was super cool because mm. that is a great way to expend a lot of energy in your dog. <laughs> um, so that's, that was really cool that she kind of played that forward. And, um, unfortunately, you know, eventually the Cushing's caught up with poor Scuttle and we did have to, um, put her down. Uh, and that, that really sucked, but she was, she was a good dog. Yep. She was the best. And now both Jen and I are getting a little misty eyed. Yeah. So I think, <laughs> thanks Scott. Okay. Um, well, that's it folks. Another month and a whole bunch of Q's and A's. And like I said, we'll be back shortly because I think in three weeks I need to get back on schedule. So uh, more questions, send them. I don't know if I'll have enough time to collect them any, but otherwise, that's it, folks. Thanks for listening. Hope you have a very, very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Above.